hands together for Brett Weinstein, Sam Harris, and Jordan Peterson. Hello, Vancouver. Thank you. Hello. All right, so we have an interesting situation here. Um, obviously, this is part two, and a few of you were here for what took place last night. We are going to find a way to catch you all up pretty quick on what took place. But before we do that, I thought it might make sense to talk to you about where we are in this discussion and why it matters. And it matters not just for those of us on stage, but it matters very much for you all in the audience. The point is basically this. We've arrived at a place in history where the sense-making apparatus that usually helps us figure out what to think about things has obviously begun to come apart. The political parties, the, uh, the universities, journalism, all of these things have stopped making sense. And alternative sense-making networks have begun to rise, and the one that we end up being a part of seems to be beating the odds with respect to staying alive and being a vibrant part of the conversation. But that depends on something. It depends on our ability to upgrade what we can discuss and navigate. And uh, Sam and Jordan have run afoul of each other in the past, as you all know, and so our ability to upgrade the conversation such that they're able to, uh, to find common ground and for us to move forward together is potentially a very, important, um, a very important upgrade. Now that upgrade in the modern era includes you all because our conversation and your conversations are all now linked through the internet. So the ground rules for tonight involve you not filming what takes place on stage tonight. And the reason for that is because what takes place on stage tonight has consequences, and the freer that Sam and Jordan feel to use new tools to try out positions that maybe they haven't explored before, the more likely we are to succeed. So please don't film. But that does not mean that we don't want you talking about what was discussed here tonight. In fact, we're very excited to see what you all make of this conversation and where it heads. Um, so, in an effort to, uh, to get you up to speed on where we got yesterday, and I think the evidence is strong, we all felt, and the uh, discussion online suggests that we actually accomplished quite a bit yesterday, that we made headway. Um, in an effort to attempt to keep that momentum going, what we are going to do is we are going to have Sam and Jordan steel man each other's points from last night, so that you can hear what that sounds like. Now. <laughs> For those of you who have ever tried steel manning somebody's point with whom you have a severe disagreement, you know just how hard this is. So let's give them some leeway. Uh, Sam, would you be willing to start? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, first let me just make the, the obvious point that, that probably isn't so obvious unless you take the time to put yourself in our shoes, but just imagine how surreal it is for us to be who we are simply having a conversation about ideas and to be able to put a date on the calendar and have all of you show up for this. I mean, it's just an amazing privilege. It's, 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 thank you for coming out. So, so here is what I think Jordan thinks I'm getting wrong. Uh, I think that was grammatically correct. Maybe there's another. Uh, note in there, but clearly I don't understand how valuable stories are, how deep they go, how, the, the, the degree to which stories encode not only the wisdom of our ancestors, but quite possibly the wisdom born of the hard knocks of evolution of, of the species, right? So there's no telling how deep the significance of the information encoded in stories goes. 
And there's a class of stories that are religious stories, and they're religious for a reason, because they're dealing with the, the deepest questions in human life. They're questions about what constitutes a good life, what's worth living for, what's worth dying for. Uh, these are things that if each individual just thrust from onto the stage of his own life, uh, not knowing where he is, and tasked with figuring out how to live all on his own, or even in a, in a collection of, of uh, others who are similarly unguided by ancient wisdom, uh, th this is not knowledge we can, uh, we can re recapitulate for ourselves easily. And so we, we edit or ignore the, these ancient stories at our peril, at, some, at minimum at some considerable risk, because we don't know how much, we don't really know what baby is in the bathwater. And uh, so we should have immense respect for these traditions. And the, this is, well, this is as yet to be discovered tonight, I'm still not quite clear about how this links up with, with pro more metaphysical propositions about the origins of, these, of, of, of certain of these stories. But at minimum, my criticism of religion because it tends to focus on the, the most obvious case of, of a zero-sum contest between religious dogmatism and you know, scientific open-ended discussion, uh, is, doesn't address this core issue of the significance of, of religious thinking and religious narrative. Because I am, for the most part, just shooting fish in, in a barrel, criticizing fundamentalists, uh, and the kind of God that the fundamentalists believe in, the God who's an invisible person who hates homosexuals, obviously that's not the, 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 deep, the deepest version of these religious, this, this, this essentially what is a narrative technology for orienting human life in the cosmos. So I, maybe I'll leave it there, but that's, I think, what Jordan thinks. Yeah. All right, uh, Jordan. Before you steal man Sam's point, how did you feel about his encapsulation of yours? Well, I, I'm convinced, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I mean, uh, well, I got a, a couple of things to say about it. It's like, first of all, I think it was uh, accurate, concise, fair. Um, I also think that this is a more technical note in some sense, is that if, if you ever want to think about something, that's exactly what you have to do. Right? You want to take arguments that are against your perspective and you want to make them as strong as you possibly can so that you can fortify your arguments against them. You don't want to make them weak because that just makes you weak. And so, you know, Sam and I are both scientists and it really is the case that what scientists are trying to do, and I think what we're actually trying to do in this conversation genuinely, is to try to find out if there's something that we're thinking that's stupid. You know, because uh, when, when I'm laying out the arguments that Sam just summarized so well, I've tried to generate a bunch of opposition to them in my own imagination, and the arguments I put forward are ones I can't undermine. But that doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean that at all. And so if someone comes along, who's, and this is certainly the case if you're a scientist who's worth his or her salt, if someone comes along and says, hey, look, you've made a mistake in this fundamental proposition, it's like, yes, great, that means I can make progress towards a more solid theory of being. So, and that's what we're trying to do, and I do think it's working, and so I thought that was just fine, exactly dead on, and I hope I can do justice to your position as well. So, okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to summarize Sam's argument briefly, and then I'm going to tell him, let, let, let you guys know why he thinks I'm, things, what things I'm not taking into account. So, <clears throat> Sam believes that there are two fundamental dangers to psychological and social stability. Um, religious fundamentalism, essentially on the right, and moral relativism and nihilism on the left. And so the danger of the right-wing position is that it enables people to arbitrarily establish certain revealed axioms as indisputable truth and then to tyrannize themselves and other people with the claims that those are divine revelations. And he sees that as part of the danger of religious fundamentalism and maybe religious thinking in general, but also as something that characterizes secular totalitarian states that also has a religious aspect. 
So that's on the right. And then on the left, well, the problem with the, with the moral relativism nihilism position is that it leaves us with no orientation. And it also flies in the face of common sense observations that there are ways to live that are bad and that there are ways to live that are good that people can generally agree on and that statements about those general agreements about how to live can be considered factual. Now, so, and, and then the next part of Sam's argument is that we require a value system that allows us to escape these twin dangers. One stultifies us and the other leaves us hopeless, let's say. And that value system has to be grounded in something real. And the only thing that he can see that actually constitutes real in any provable sense, and there, there's a certain amount of historical and conceptual weight behind this claim, is the domain of empirical facts as, as they've been manifested in the sciences and technologies that have made us incredibly powerful and increasingly able to flourish in the world. And so we need to ground our value propositions in something that we've been able to determine has genuine solidity to, so that we can so that we can orient ourselves properly, so that we can make moral claims and that we can avoid these twin dangers. We can begin with some basic facts that we can identify, as I mentioned brief briefly, what constitutes a bad life, endless pain, suffering, anxiety, tremendous amount of negative emotion, short-term lifespan, all the things that no one would choose voluntarily for themselves if, if we would all agree that they were thinking in a, in a healthy manner. And we can contrast that sort of domain of horror with the good life, which might involve, well, certainly freedom from privation and want and undue threat and anxiety and hope for the future and all of that, and that we can agree that those are poles, good, bad, and good, and that that's a factual claim. So he, Sam also claims that we can define the good life, this is an extension of it, with re reference to flourishing and well-being, and that, that that can actually be measured, and that we should and can inform the idea of flourishing and well-being with empirical data. Having said all that, he also leaves uh, a, 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 what would you, a domain of inquiry open that would be centered on the possibility that some of the ideas that have been encapsulated in religious phenomenology, if not in religious dogma, might be worth pursuing as well, that there might be wisdom that could practically be applied in terms of perception to, to spiritual practices, although those become danger when, dangerous, increasingly dangerous as they become ensconced in dogma. And so that's Sam's position. And then his criticism of my ideas, um, <clears throat> he, he would say that it's facts, not stories, that constitute the ground for the proper science of well-being, uh, and that we don't need to be connected to stories, ancient stories in particular, to thrive. And the reason for that are that these ancient stories are pathological in certain details, especially in the specific claims they make, uh, which, which look outrageous in some sense from a modern moral perspective. Um, and he believes that it's hand-waving to ignore those specific topics at, with, with, a, you know, with a, what would you call it, an optimistic overview of the entire context, uh, that, that they're, they're dangerously outdated now, if they ever were useful, um, that they're subject to too many potential interpretations for any modern usage to be reliably derived. And so he believes that attempts to interpret these stories, let's say, um, are rife with so many potential errors of bias and interpretation and subjectivity that all the interpretations in some sense are unreliable um, and perhaps equally unreliable. That, they're da that worse than that, not only are they unreliable, but they're dangerous insofar as the claims they lay out are, pose a threat to scientific and enlightenment values, which are the true savers of humanity, as evidenced by our progress, let's say, over the last two or three hundred years, and that they're also susceptible to the totalitarian interpretation, which I described earlier, which confer upon the interpreter a sense of and then a claim to reveal truth. And so I would say that's Sam's argument and his and his criticisms of my position, so. Okay, so you, you, you write my next book, I'll write yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Sam, how do you feel about that characterization of your position? Uh, certainly close enough to get the conversation started. I mean, there's a few, the grounding <laughs> stuff we, ha we have yet to talk about, and I'm not as, I'm not as much a stickler for materialistic scientific empiricism as I heard implied there, but we can, we can come okay, to that. Well that. Okay, well okay. so hold, hold on. Yep, yep. I think from the point of view of the yeah. audience, this is, a, this is a good barometer of where we got to last night, and I think actually the gains are 
really impressive, which I have to say is spooking me because of something called regression to the mean. Now, if I catch either one of you regressing to the mean tonight, I will hunt you down and I will ridicule you on Twitter tomorrow. So you have been warned. Okay. Um, all right. So do either one of you want to now uh, talk about what was missing from the other characterization or how do you want to move? I, I think we should touch this issue of, of metaphorical truth because I think it, it still gets at the, the distance between us. Sure. Uh, yep, yep. And, it's, and, it's, and happily, this is your phrase that you have, I mean, you might wanna, do you want to, do you want to prop up this phrase? Why not? Yeah. Um, so the idea of metaphorical truth, which I think actually is the reconciliation between at least the points that uh, you guys each started out with, is the idea that there are concepts which are literally false, that we can falsify in a scientific, rational sense, but that if you behave as if they were true, you come out ahead of where you were if you behave according to the fact that they are false. And so to call these things simply false is an error. In effect, the universe has left them true in some sense other than a purely literal one. And so religions would then, according to actually what you heard from uh, both Sam and Jordan, uh, religions would fall into this class of things. These are encapsulations of uh, stories and prescriptions that if you follow them, irrespective of whether they literally describe the universe, you end up with certain advantages that you, you may not know why they are there, but nonetheless, you, you are ahead of your, uh, you are, you're ahead of your position if you were to navigate just simply on your, your perceptions. So right. that's the concept. Yeah. yeah, so I think there's a good analogy that, that you and I stumbled onto after we did a podcast together. You had a, an analogy about a porcupine that could shoot its quills, which many people balked at, but a, a listener got, gave us a better one, which was the idea that uh, anyone who's worked with guns at, at all must have heard this admonishment to treat every gun as if it is loaded, right? And you actually, when I, last night when I uh, alleged that you believed in God, you corrected me, you said, no, you live as if God exists, right? And so this, this seems like a, there's a, uh, a connection here. So if, you're, if, you know, if I had a gun here that I wanted to show Brett, if I know anything about guns, I'm going to make damn sure that it's unloaded, right? I'm going to pull back the slide, I'm going to drop the magazine, pull back the slide, check the chamber, and do this in a redundant fashion that, that really looks like I'm suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, it, it is truly redundant. Uh, and then I'll hand it to Brett, and if Brett knows anything about guns, he will do the same thing having just seen me do it. And if he hands it back to me, again, I will do the same thing, even though there may be no ammunition around, right? So it really is crazy at the level of our explicit knowledge of the situation, and yet absolutely necessary to do. And it's, it's not merely, it's, it, it runs very deep. I mean, I would, at that whole time, you, you're careful not to point the barrel of the gun at anything you would be afraid to shoot. Uh, and when people, fail to live this way around guns, they, with some unnerving frequency, actually shoot themselves or people close to them by accident. Uh, so it is really the only proper hedge against just the, 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 the odds of being in proximity to, to uh, loaded weapons. And yet, if someone in the middle of this operation came up to us and said, you know, actually there's a casino that just opened across the street that will take your bets about whether or not guns are loaded. Would you like to bet a million dollars as to whether or not this gun is loaded? Well, of course, I would bet those million dollars every time that it's not loaded because I know it's not loaded. And so there's, there's, a, there's a literal truth and a, a metaphorical truth, which, you know, otherwise known as a, a very useful fiction, which in this case is actually more useful than the truth, right? But the only way I can understand its utility is and, and even utter the phrase metaphorical truth in a way that's comprehensible is in the context of distinguishing it from literal truth. So and, and, yeah, go ahead. This, this is fascinating, Sam, actually. This is, this is I think, next so phase of I'm, I'm a little, I'm worried by how excited you are by <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, so I have a, a little st story that might be helpful about that. And so uh, you, you, can, you can tell me what, what you think about, you okay. can think about this. Okay, so, so, 
one of the things that I've been reconsidering since we talked last night is, is the nature of our dispute about the relationship between facts and values. Because I, I think I can make a case that what I've been trying to do, especially in my first book, was to ground values in facts. But I'm not doing it the same way that you are exactly. So, so I, I don't want to make that a point, point of contention. So, and I'll get to that in a moment. But with regards to this metaphorical truth, let, let me tell you something. You, you tell me what you think about this. So, one of the things that's been observed by anthropologists worldwide is that human beings tend to make sacrifices. So I'm going to spend two minutes, three minutes, laying out a sacrificial story. And the reason I want to do it is because, see, what I think happened with regards to the origin of these profound stories is that people first started to behave in certain ways that had uh, survival significance. And that was selected for as a consequence of, 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 of the, the standard selection practices. And so that was instantiated in behavior. And then because we could observe ourselves, because we're self-conscious creatures, that we started to make representations of those patterns and dramatize them and then encapsulate them in stories. So it's a bottom up from, from the, so it would be sort of like ch chimpanzees or wolves become aware of their dominance hierarchy structures and the strategies that they use. So a wolf, for example, mm. if two wolves are having a dominance dispute, one, the wolf that gives up first, lays down and puts his neck open so the other wolf can tear it out, and then the other wolf doesn't. And you could say, well, it's as if a wolf is following a rule about not killing a weaker member of the pack. Of course, wolves don't have rules, they have behavioral patterns. But a self-conscious wolf would watch what the wolves were doing and then say, well, it's as if we're acting out the idea that each wolf in the pack has intrinsic value. And then that starts to be, and maybe mm -hmm. the wolves would have a little story about the, the, the heroic forbearing wolf that doesn't tear out the neck of its opponents and that that's a good wolf, well, that's good wolf ethics. And, right. and, and so, but it's, grounded, but it's grounded in the actual behavior. Okay, so let's, we'll put that aside for a second. Now, here, here's the sacrificial story. So human beings have made sacrifices. It seems to be a standard practice all around the world. And in the biblical narratives, they would often sacrifice something of value, like a, like a valuable animal. Well, like a child. Start, let's start well, with that. Well, <laughs> look, no, 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 look, look, I'm not, I'm not making light of this. I know that human yeah. sacrifice was a part of this. Yeah, but, so, but, but, but that's, again, so just, to, just to give you a, a crib on where my mind goes here is yep. human, human sacrifice is as old a religious precept as we know about. Yes. It's a cultural universal. The, the other sacrifices are derivations from it. Circumcision yes. is a surrogate for the far more b barbaric act of human sacrifice. And, you know, it, it answers every test you would put to it with respect to its archetypal significance, its, 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 its compelling uh, presence in stories across all cultures. But the horror is that it actually has taken place in all these cultures based on yes. explicit beliefs in the presence of just, just right. well, uh, Arthur oppressive Kessler, scientific ignorance. Arthur right? so Kessler you, used that as an argument for the essential insanity of humanity. Right? Well, yeah, so, no, but it's not just the insanity of humanity, it's the, the misapprehension of the causal structure of the cosmos. You don't uh, know what that, controls okay. the weather, well, you don't know why people get sick, you think your neighbor is capable of, of casting magic spells on you, you're ignorant of everything, and you're trying to force some order on things, and yeah. so, when you don't, in the absence of engineers, and you don't know why build, certain buildings fall down, you actually can agree with your neighbor that maybe you should bury your firstborn child into every post hole of this new building, which in fact has, it took place. Uh, and it's the consequence of ignorance. And so that, the problem is, if you're only going to talk about this you know, purified notion strange, of sacrifice. It's a very strange consequence of ignorance, Sam. Like, well, you it's, th it's, it's, it's the notion that we're in relationship to invisible others that can, that, that can mistreat us based on our are. not having offered enough. We're, we are. We're in, when but we're, not, we're not, in not precisely those others. Well, but we're in relationship to the invisible others who will judge us in the future. Okay, so, but that, so again, you're, change, you're changing the noun in important well, ways. I, I know, but I'm also trying to understand, and I, I'm not trying to argue against the horror of child sacrifice. No, I, I, I would never imagine I know, you would. I know, I know. But I'm also, yeah, but I'm yes. also trying Although to... The, I'm but trying my to, work would be much easier if you I'm, did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the work of journalists as yeah. well, although yeah. they've tried that pretty much anyways. <laughs> That's right. So, 
Right, that would be, that would even be worse than enforced monogamy, <laughs> hypothetically. No doubt. No. Yes. No. So, okay, so, see, I'm, let's say that I'm trying to give the devil his due, and I'm trying to understand from an evolutionary perspective, like a cognitive behavioral evolutionary perspective, let's say, why that particular set of ideas would emerge, and in many, many, many places, perhaps autonomously, or once having emerged, would spread like wildfire. It's like, mm. because I'm not willing to only attribute it to ignorance. Now, we can attribute it to ignorance, no problem, man. But, but there's more going on there because it is a human universal. And like, there's all sorts of things that happen in nature as a consequence of biological and evolutionary processes that don't work out well for our current s state of, of moral intuition, let's Agreed. say. Yes. Okay, so one of the things, because I've been thinking about this sacrificial motif for a very long time, and trying to figure out what the, what, what the hell's the idea here exactly? And so, so here, here's one way of thinking about it. Um, if you give up something of value now, you can gain something of more value in the future. Okay, so let's think about that idea for a minute. So the first thing is, that's a, that's a hell of an idea. Yeah, that's well, delay, of delay, yeah, delay of gratification. That's yeah. right. That's the discovery of the future as well. And so you might say, well, the notion of sacrifice is exactly the same thing as the discovery of the future. If we give up something we really value now, we can make a pact with the structure of existence itself such that better things will happen to us in the future. Now, yes. okay, now, what's weird about this, and it's hard to understand, is that it works. So when I talk to my students, for example, and I say, what did your parents sacrifice to send you to university? Many of them are children of first-generation immigrants. And so, like, man, they're on that story in a second, right? They know all sorts of things that their parents sacrificed. And they're delaying gratification in the present for a radically delayed return in the future. Now, you think, animals, generally speaking, they might act out the idea of delayed gratification as a consequence of running out their instincts, but they don't conceptualize it. It's not obvious that animals give up something they value right now in order to thrive in the future. There's an old story about how to catch a monkey, right? So yeah. you put a jar up with rocks in it, and you put little candies, and it's a narrow neck jar. You put little candies on top of the rocks. You put a few candies in front of the, of the jar. Then the monkey comes along and picks up the candies, puts his hand in the jar, grabs the candies, and can't get it out. Yeah. I well, still they, don't know if this actually works on monkeys or if it's just a great story. Well, but, I, I've, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know either. And yeah. I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard various claims. But, but, but the point is you can go pick up the monkey. He yeah. won't let go of the candies. Now, perhaps he would. But the, 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 the issue is, is that it's not obvious that animals will forego an immediate gratification for a future gratification. I, now, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think that's right, actually. And I actually want to hold Well, the question is, can, will they do it consciously? Ah. They might act it out. They act it out. That's not the it's, issue. It's very hard to know if it's conscious because they won't respond to the questionnaires. But I know, I know. <laughs> and, it, and, and obviously, the, the line between acting it out and becoming, starting to consciously represent it is, is a tenuous one. But what looks to me like what happened is that after we observed that people who were capable of delaying gratification, sacrifice things that they valued in order to obtain a future goal, and it worked, that we started to codify that as a representation and then started to act it out. And okay. so, so the story, and, and you'd say, well, that produced strange variants, but, but there's a reason for that too, as far as I can say. So imagine this, imagine that there's a rule of thumb. Sacrificing what you find valuable now will ensure certain benefits in the future. Well, then the question becomes, how good could those future benefits be? And so that might be heavenly, let's say, in the archetypal extreme. And what's the ultimate sacrifice that you have to perform? And then I would say, well, the child sacrifice fits into that category. And so it's, it's as if those ideas were pushed to the radical extreme. And you could say, well, that's a pathological extreme. It's like, well, it is. It is a pathological extreme. but. But I think we also have to understand that some of the things that we've learned as we've evolved towards our current state of, of wisdom, such as it is, is that they were learned in a very bloody and catastrophic way. They were learned in, with incredible difficulty. And delay of gratification was certainly one of those, because it's a hell of a thing to learn when you're in conditions of privation. Okay. Yeah, I think that the issue here for me is that you don't need a conception of, you, you don't need any kind of positive gloss on human sacrifice as a meme or as an archetype in order to form a coherent picture of the future 
that can motivate you. So delay, delayed gratification is fully separable from a notion that it might ever be rational or good to sacrifice a child as an offering to an invisible other that doesn't well, but exist. But how do you know it's separable? Because that's the developmental history. As you said, the, well, that, so the sacrifices even if came I, first. I, I, think it's, I think it is, in fact, historically separable, but let, let's just say it's not. Let's just say it's a matter of our origins. They're united. They're of a piece. It's just, it is the genetic fallacy to care about that origin. I mean, there are, to, to say that the that is the only path forward toward a notion of the future, given where we've come from, or that it's somehow necessary to, to venerate now, or that it's good well, that we, we do took that venerate, path. But we do venerate the idea of sacrifice now, but I would say that but what's I would happened say, I would say we do it to, to the detriment of our moral intuitions in the religious context. So, for instance, I think that the, the notion that Christian, I mean, Christianity is actually a cult of human sacrifice. Christianity is not a religion that repudiates human sacrifice. Christianity is a religion that says, actually, no, human sacrifice is necessary, and there was only one that, in fact, was necessary and effective, and that's the sacrifice of mm. Jesus. And I think that is, when you dig into the details, uh, not only a morally uninteresting vision of our circumstance and how we, are, how we can be redeemed, it's morally abhorrent, okay. right? So I think there's, uh, there's better versions okay, so online. Let, let so me okay, let me ask you a question about that. So um, in, 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 in the moral landscape, you lay out this pathway. There's the bad life and there's the good life, right? And, and you, right. you described what they were. And the bad life is a variation of hellish circumstances. And the good life is a variant of hypothetically the life that we would like to lead. And your conception is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, your conception is that the proper pathway forward, so that would be the moral endeavor, is to move away from the bad and towards the good. Yeah, insofar as we understand which way is up, yes. Yes. We, well, we, right, uh, the, yes. The, the, the basic claim is that we can be right or wrong with respect to, to true, our true, beliefs True, there. true, true. Yeah. We, do, we don't necessarily know how to do that in an unerring manner, and, yeah. and we could subject that to approximation correction along the way, and we should, but we can outline the broad scheme. Yeah. which is progress away from hell towards something that's positive. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I would say that there's an implicit claim in that that you should sacrifice everything in you that isn't serving that to that. And I would say that that's essentially the same claim that's made in Christianity. Well, again, that is a... I mean, I understand the impulse to up-level these barbaric ignorance-derived beliefs, right, to something that is morally, that is interesting and palatable in, in, in the current context. And I, I, I understand you can do that. My concern there is you can do that with everything. I mean, you could do it with witchcraft. Why not do the exact same thing you're doing with religion to the history of witchcraft? Witchcraft is as as, as well Well, modern described. witches would do that. So, so that's a perfectly valid right, criticism. But, but, yeah, but so it's, but it's a that should be of concern. I mean, the, the reasons why we don't look, want to endorse look, modern absolutely. witchcraft, right? Look, absolutely. And so, so you know, one but, of your But, I mean, I'm not talking, and modern, witchcraft currently exists. I mean, you go to Africa, they're, they're, you know, people are hunting albinos for their body parts because they believe in sympathetic magic, and, yes. and, ki and kids get killed as witches. So, this belief endures in certain pockets of humanity, and we're right to, I mean, I just think at, at a certain point, you have to acknowledge that some ideas are not only wrong, but their, their effects are disastrous, or have been disastrous, or will likely be, even if good in certain circumstances, will likely be disastrous in the future. And then we shouldn't be hostage to these, these ancient memes. We shouldn't have to figure out how to make the most of the worst idea that anyone's ever had, which is you should, maybe you should sacrifice your firstborn child to a, okay. be, a being so, you've so never seen. Hold yep. on, Sam, I, I wanna hold your feet to the fire here a okay. little bit. Um, two points. One, interesting observation. When you presented the example, so on your podcast I had argued uh, that uh, believing that porcupines can throw their quills might protect you from a porcupine that might wheel around even though porcupines can't throw their quills. Your uh, listener sent the better example, which was all guns are loaded. When you presented it, you didn't say all guns are loaded. 
Well, you said it, treat all guns as if they are loaded, which is, I yeah. think, the same reflex that you have faced with any metaphorical truth, which is that it can always be unpacked. But, it, but actually, that's the way Jordan talks about believing in God as well. Right, and yeah. actually, so, so this is, but then if we take something like, uh, you, so you say, uh, all right, sacrifice of children is abhorrent. Hmm. Let's say it is. And then you say, well, Christianity hasn't, uh, foregone the sacrifice of children. In fact, it's described one child who is sacrificed for everybody else. But arguably, that's an upgrade of some metaphorical truth that frees those who are adhering to this tradition from ever considering sacrificing a child. And what sure. it does is it uh, provides a motivational structure that may, in fact, have very positive outgrowths, though not literal, the idea that someone would have sacrificed their own child uh, for the benefit of everybody else mm. not to have to, that idea might um, engender a, a, a large amount of good work that would sure. result, as Jordan is pointing well, out. Well, let, let me just concede that the hardest case for me, I mean, which, which I did up top, to, just in defining, uh, when, after you define metaphorical truth, and I use the gun example, there's certainly cases where the useful fiction is more useful than the truth. I would, I would grant that, but you know, I think those cases are few and far between, but handling guns is one of them. It's just not useful when the, when the casino opens across the street and you can place a million dollar bet, right? Then you want, you want to have some purchase on the literal truth. So you want to be able to, and, and again, this is psychologically interesting because uh, and I keep com coming back to the gun example because the one that, that is viscerally real to me. Like, if, if I have a real gun that I know to be unloaded, I still emotionally can't treat it as a harmless object. I can't point it at my child just for the fun of it b because, you know, that we're going to play cops and robbers now with a real gun, right? This, this, I, have a, I have a superstitious attachment to always being safe with the gun, right? And it's, and it's important, it's important that that get ingrained and yet it is not strictly, ra it's, it's, it's not irrational because it has good effects, but it's, it's not actually in register with what I know to be true factually in each moment. Right, so, okay. so it's so very here, low cost. Here, here. Yeah, it's very it's, low it's, cost. It's very low cost. It's not yep. dividing societies and, and yep. causing yep. people to go to war. And yep. if you were gonna teach a child gun safety, you would want to encode this so that they yes. would automatically know never to behave as if a gun is unloaded because that's what gets you into trouble. Yeah. As an adult, every, every gun owner recognizes the distinction between the metaphorical truth and the literal truth here. But I guess what I suspect is going on here is that your <clears throat> mechanism for dealing with the world involves unpacking all of these things, and I think it's highly productive, but it also means that you have a hard time understanding why anybody would do anything different. And that's the question, is just because we can track fully the difference between guns actually all being loaded and behaving as if all guns are loaded, right? That one, there's no leftover, there's nothing, there's no mystery there, right? Mm -hmm. But there may be many of these things for which there is some difficulty lining up the metaphorical truth with the literal truth and operating according to the metaphorical truth might have advantages, which I think is what you're well, getting can, at. So, well, so here's, here's another uh, situation because you know, we have to remember what kind of catastrophic past we emerged from and how much privation ruled the world prior to 1895, essentially. And mm -hmm. certainly the farther back you go, the more bloody and horrible it was. I mean, how often do you think it was necessary, and this is not obviously something I'm in favor of, and this is also one of these situations where we get to play with ideas that we might not otherwise play with, how often do you think it was necessary for people in the past who had absolutely no access to birth control and who didn't have enough food to sacrifice a child for the survival of their family? I mean, okay. God only well, knows, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and that's, well, but that's worth thinking about. It's like, you know, the life is unbelievably cruel and difficult. And one of the problems that comes when you discover the future is that you might have to make the most painful of sacrifices. And lots of, lots of archaic people do this sort of thing. They do that with their elderly people. They do that with mm. sick people. They do that with infants that they deem too fragile to survive. Like, so part of child sacrifice, and I know the literature on child sacrifice reasonably well, part of child sacrifice seemed to emerge out of the um, 
observable necessity to leave someone behind so that everyone else didn't die. And we don't know how often that had to happen in the mm -hmm. past. It might have had to happen a lot. Right. Now, obviously... Yeah. Although, uh, just, just yeah. in, in the interest of kind of conceptual clarity here, yeah. human sacrifice is a larger horror than that. So you have what was very common is the sacrificing of, uh, you know, captives. So you take the Aztec sacrifices oh, yes. where you, you know, you now have slaves, some of whom you're going to... Yeah, the Aztecs sacrificed yeah. about yeah. 25,000 people a year. Yeah. So. Yeah, look, I mean, so. it's, it's clearly a bloody mess. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, one of the things that you see happening in the biblical narrative, which is extraordinarily interesting, is that you see echoes of child sacrifice at the beginning, but what happens is the sacrificial notion gets increasingly psychologized as the story progresses. So, you know, you see that transition with um, Abraham and Isaac, yeah. where, the, where the, sac the child sacrifice is actually forbidden, although previously demanded by God. And then you also see it, as you already laid out, in the substitution of the circumcision for the idea of sacrifice itself. Right. And then what seems to happen... See, I'm trying to figure out how these ideas develop psych psychologically from their behavioral underpinnings, is that eventually it becomes psychologized completely. So you can say, well... We can, we can conceptualize a sacrifice in the abstract so my parents can sacrifice to send me to university without anything or anyone having to die. It transforms itself from something that's enacted out as a dramatic ritual into something that's a psychological reality. But all that blood and catastrophe along the way is part of the process by which the idea comes to emerge. Right. It doesn't but, so what is the connection of all of this? Because, yes, so there, there is this history, and I would argue we are busily trying to outgrow much of it, if not most of it, whether it's evolutionary history or just we the, might the be cultural history. We might history. be trying to transmute it so that it becomes, we, we, can, we can maintain, as you, you suggested we do, we can maintain what's useful in the tradition and throw out everything that's pathological. Yes, as, but we're, we're constantly discovering a, a lack of fit between both our, what we perceive in ourselves as biological yep. imperatives and the cultural legacies of just what mommy and daddy taught me was true, right? Which yes. we have now every reason to believe might not be true. And we're trying to optimize our thoughts and institutions and, and relationships with one another for our current circumstance. And yet we have this legacy effect of mm -hmm. certain books and certain ways of, of speaking have a completely different status. And they have this status because they may, in fact, it, it's imagined, not be the products of merely previous human minds, but they may be the products of omniscience. And that, this is where the respect accorded to religious tradition is totally unlike the respect we would accord to anything else. You know, mythology, right. literature, past science, past philosophy. I mean, you know, people can read Plato and Aristotle uh, for their entire lives, with ever, without ever being fully captured by the kind of dogmatism that, that every religion well, demands that you be captured I by would, if you're really say, going to be an adherent. I would say so. that's actually an archetypal truth. You know, the idea that the pathological tradition stands in the way of update. That's an archetypal truth. I mean, one of the reasons why in, in, in creation myths, one of the variants of a creation myth is that the hero has to slay a tyrannical giant in order to make, it, make the world out of his pieces. And it's a metaphorical restatement of the idea that a tr tradition can become hidebound, and when it becomes hidebound and too rigid, that it interferes with current adaptation. But the problem is, and, and this is, I think, this is something we really need to hash out. The problem is, the problem that you're describing is the problem of a priori structure. Now, some of that's textual, but some of it isn't textual. Some of it resides in us as our psyche, insofar well, as, say, no, as no, we no, act. The, the problem I'm, I'm describing here is that we have two categories of, of books in this case. Right? We have those written by people like ourselves, just endlessly open for criticism and, and conjecture, and those written by invisible, okay. omniscient but, entities. But I would presume and, that if these religious systems weren't codified in books, if they were still just enacted or, or dramatized, you'd have the same objection. It's not the fact that they're in books that's relevant. Well, no, but it, it is the dogmatism. It's the fact that right. we, can't, we can't jettison the okay. bad parts. Okay, it's the dogmatism. Okay, so to yeah. me, that's the same as the problem of structure. Now, here, here's, the, here's the problem, I think, with the way that your argument is laid out. And I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. It seems to me that this is a place where it needs to be developed because I see that the attempt that you make to derive the world of value from the world of facts as 
as justifiable given what it is that you're attempting to do, which in principle is to make the world a better place. But there's a massive gap in there. It's like, how do you do it? Because the objection that you place on my, my reasoning, let's say, mm -hmm. which is, well, the problem with these texts is that there's an infinite number of interpretations and which of them can you, how can you determine which of those is canonically correct is exactly and precisely the same criticism that can be levied against your attempt to extract a world of value from the domain of facts. It's well, the, the same well, problem. Well, it's not an in, infinite number of interpretations in either case, but I, I allow it's for... It's close a, enough to infinite so that... Well, so it, it might be. I mean, that's why the moral landscape for me is a landscape of peaks and valleys. And so, you know, I, I'm totally open to the possibility, in fact, certainty that there are different ways for similar minds and certainly different ways for different minds to be constellated so that they, they have equivalent but irreconcilable peaks on the landscape. So you know, there's, there's a that, lot of well-being over here, yeah. and there's a lot of well-being over here, and there's a valley in between. And so it's, it's a kind of moral relativism. It's kind of like, you know, this is, this is great, and this is great, but these are irreconcilable, right? Uh, so well, I'd like to see that made more concrete, and I need to know how that fits in with your conception, because one of the claims that you make in the moral landscape is that the distinction between the bad life mm -hmm. and the good life is not only... It's like it's a factual distinction. Yeah. It's, it's universally it's universally apprehensible and true. It's your I think it's your fundamental axiomatic claim, mm -hmm. and I don't see how that's commensurate with the position that you just put forward. Well, so, so uh, here's the position, and you can forget about morality as a concept for this. I mean, I think the, the the starting point is deeper than morality. The starting point, and this is all this is our starting point, all of us right now in the universe. The starting point is. We are conscious, right? We have, a, we have a circumstance that admits of qualitative experience. And again, this is true, whatever, however we understand consciousness, whatever is actually happening, we could be living in a simulation, this could be a dream, you could be a brain in a vat, uh, consciousness could just be the product of neurochemistry or we could have eternal souls running on, on somehow, somehow integrated with the brain. Whatever is true, something seems to be happening. And these seemings can be really, really bad or really, really good. We know each one of us in our lives have experienced this range of possibility. And yes, there are caveats here. There are hard and painful experiences that have a silver lining, right? That give you some other capacity where you could say, well, you know, that really sucked, but I'm a better person for it, right? And we can understand what it means to be a better person for it in terms, again, of this range of experience, which I, you know, I'm, I'm calling, to, subsuming all of this, uh, the, the positive end of this uh, as well-being, which is to say that you know, I'm a better person for it because now, you know, having endured that ordeal, I am capable of much greater compassion, or I, I appreciate my life more. You know, the cancer made me a better person. Now that I've, I'm cured, I value each moment of life uh, more than I ever did. Uh, all of these claims are intelligible within a context of an open-ended context of exploring this space of possible experience. So what I'm saying is forget about morality, forget about right and wrong and good and evil. What is undeniable is that what we have here is a navigation problem. We have a, a, a space of possible experience. And again, this is not just a human problem, this is a problem for any possible conscious mind. We have a space of possible experience in which we can navigate and, we, and things can get excruciating and pointlessly horrible where there are no silver linings and we get this can this can happen individually in some you know episode of madness that never ends uh, if there really is a Christian hell to go to well then it can it's gonna happen to me after I die right given what I've said on this stage uh, if uh, and so it matters who's right obviously if I knew that uh, an eternity of fiery torment awaited somebody who didn't make the right noises about one or uh, one faith or another. Well, then it would only be rational to make those right noises, right? So it's it's my bet. I'm placing a bet on certain pictures of reality being wrong, but uh, the reality is is we're navigating in this space, and morality and ethics are, are the terms we use for how we think about our behavior affecting one another's experience. So if you're in a moral solitude, if you're on a desert island, or if you're you know, on a, uh, alone in the universe, 
morality is not the issue you need to worry about, but well-being still is an ever-present issue. It's possible to suffer and it's possible to, to experience bliss and, and some, perhaps something beyond that. And we, the horizon in both directions is something we uh, will we'll never fully explore, explore very likely. I mean, we, we don't know how good things can get and we don't know how bad they can get, but, but that there's a spectrum here is undeniable. And I, I would say that, that my moral realism simply entails that we acknowledge that it's possible not to know what you're missing. It's possible to be living in a way where you are less happy than you could be and not to know why, right? And to just not have the wisdom to make the changes. And that matters. If anything matters, that matters. And, and it matters to us individually and it matters to us collectively. And that mattering is our, is the, subsumes everything we can intelligibly want in this domain of value. And that's, and so again, it's, it's the, the, the cash value of any value claim is in the, the actual or potential change in consciousness for some conscious system somewhere, sometime. And that's, that's my claim. And that's, can I, can I try to get, I would like you each to clarify something. So it sounds to me, Sam, like you are hypothesizing that a rationalist approach will always beat a traditional metaphorical approach with respect to the generation of well-being. Well, well not always, but enough, there's so many obvious downsides to the traditional sectarian dogmatic approach that we should want to get out of the religion business as fast as possible. Okay, so okay but as fast as possible, but do you mean that it has always been true that we should always have gotten away from it as fast as possible, or do you mean now we should get away from it as fast as possible, but there is a point somewhere in the past where it might have been true that actually the best, the most, uh, the richest path to well-being might have been encoded metaphorically? Oh, yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. And in, in fact, you might even say it was likely based on the fact that we have all of these systems still around. Right. Okay. So but, we but, still but, have the systems around in part because our, like, we, still, we still think in metaphor and we actually can't help it because like, half of our brain is oriented towards metaphor. But can, can I get you to clarify something now? Yes. Okay. So you have argued, and you've actually quite surprised me by doing so, you've argued that the dogmatism is a bug and not a feature. You've argued... No, it's a bug and a feature. Okay, it's a bug and a feature, good. So, yes. um, but you, what, what I thought I heard you say was that the um, resistance to update yes. was uh, a problem, that effectively it was an obstacle. Yeah, so is lack of resistance to update. Right, okay, There's good. There's problems everywhere, man. Well, it's, there's a tension. <laughs> Okay. There is a tension. There's a tension. There's a terrible tension. Okay. Right, well, look, at, look well, at it this way. Look at it this way. Most new ideas are stupid and dangerous. Yeah. But, but most but old ideas are, are as well. I mean, that's, but some of them are vital. Yeah. Right, and so we have, we're screwed both ways. It's like, well, if we stay locked in our current mode of apprehension, all hell's going to break loose. If we generate a whole bunch of new solutions, most of them are going to be wrong and we're going to die. And so what we need to do is, and, well, it, it's a Darwinian claim in some sense, is that... Yep. Despite the fact that most new ideas are stupid and dangerous, a subset of them are so vital that if we don't incorporate them, we're all going to perish. That's the bloody existential condition. And so now, and part of the issue here, and see, and I think that this is, the problem is, is that, let's take the, the dogma idea. Okay, so there's the dogma incorporated in the books, but I'm going to throw away the books because the dogma was there before the books. And then the question is, where was the dogma? And the answer was, the dogma was in the cultural practices, but it, and in and in the agreement that people made with regards to those cultural practices, but it was also part and parcel of the intrapsychic structure that enables us to perceive the world as such. Now, the problem is, and I think this is the central place where we need to flesh out these ideas, is that you cannot view the world without an a priori structure, and that a priori structure has a dogmatic element. And so you can't just say, well, let's get rid of the dogma, because you well, can't perceive the world without it, a structure. It has an uninspected element. I mean, so if you're talking about just you know, perceiving the world, yes, we have, a, we have perceptual structure that allows for us to perceive the world. And we know that there are failure states, right? So we know, we know for instance, that we are, we are, we've evolved to perceive you know, in visual space based on a... a literally neurological expectation that light sources will be from above, right? And so we know that we can produce visual illusions based on gaming that 
expectation, right? But that's not the same thing as a, a, a dogma w subscribed to by some, some subset of humanity that is antithetical to another dogma subscribed to by it, another set of humanity that has nothing to do with underlying biology. There's something that's, that's changeable. It's not so obvious. No, but it's changeable with, yep. in real time based on just conversations like this. Like, yep. you know, we could have, you know, I get emails from people who can point to the, the paragraph where they lost their faith, right? Where in reading somebody, in reading Richard Dawkins or, or, or hearing a debate between, between uh, me and some theologian, where it's just it, it, a collision against rationality, which is so useful in every other context, suddenly pr proves its utility in this context where they think, well, okay, clearly I know the Muslims are wrong about the status of the Quran. Let me, let me take that, that, that spirit of criticism in, in the internal space of my own culture and, and what, what moves? Well, a dogmatic attachment to Christianity has to move by that same standard. Well, it's and, that's, and, and it's possible to do that, and that's not a matter of getting into the brain and changing your perceptual apparatus that has... Well, that the, the, the distinction between different levels of, of, what would you call it, structure related processing in the brain and the relationship to the underlying biology isn't clear. Like, and it isn't clear when that's biological and when, is it, when it isn't. So, you know, y your, your, con your comments about our a priori perceptual structures notwithstanding, there's no clear line between what constitutes an instantiated, accurate biological perception and something that shades more into a cultural uh, uh, presupposition. So it's a, it's a gray area. Now, here, let me ask you a question. So th this is one of the things I've been thinking about. So, this is, this is designed to point out the difference. I'm not making the claim that the idea that we should ground values in facts is wrong. I'm not gonna make that claim, although I think it's way more complicated than we've opened up so far. Mm. But I would say is, I can, I think, relatively easily demonstrate a situation in which you cannot find the value from the facts. Let's say you own an antique. Okay, it's valuable. And you think, I'm gonna take this antique apart and I'm gonna find out where the value is. Good luck, man. Well, it's, it's not valuable in that sense. Wait, no, wait a second, wait a second. So we need to know, so that's right, it's not valuable in that sense because the value of the antique is a social agreement about its position in a hierarchy. It has nothing to do with the material substrate of the antique. Well, sure. Yeah, but, but not, you can't, it's not just sure. It's that you're already, you've made the claim already that you can derive values from facts. It's like, then what are you willing to well, accept no, no, as these, a fact? These are facts about, again, so there are facts about the facts exist in intersubjective space, right? So if I, if I tell you, well, this glass, this isn't just an ordinary glass, I know it looks just like that one, but this is the glass that uh, Elton John drank from right, in his exactly, last concert exactly, here, yeah, right? Right, right. Uh, so, you know, what do you want to pay me for it, right? Right. It, it could be that, you know, you're just the biggest Elton John fan ever, and you, it's worth quite a lot to you. Now that is, it's a kind of, evident, it's not value intrinsic to the glass, but right. it is, it is, it is a... Where's the value located? Well, it's a, it's a measure in, in the change this provokes in your experience, right? Just the idea, I mean, we value ideas as much as anything else, and that's, you know, that's hence the, the mad work done by religion, right? I mean, because it's not, these aren't facts on the ground, these are ideas that rule people's lives. I mean, people well, spend their whole life okay. afraid so of it, hell. Okay, right? it seems to me that it's easier in some sense, rather than to relate the value of that, and I love the Elton John's glass example. I yeah, was going well, to use Elvis Presley's it's guitar. It's here, I will, for the I will same tell it thing. to you. It's like, where in the guitar is the fact that it's Elvis Presley's guitar? Well, it's nowhere in the guitar. Well, what is it in, where is it then? And the answer is, it's in the dominance hierarchy of values that's been socially constructed around the guitar. It's located in interpersonal space. And that, that location, so value is located in interpersonal space. And if you want to say, well, that's also a fact, it's like, okay, but we're well, starting it's to stretch the It's a fact the about the beliefs and desires and conscious states of all the people involved. Okay, right? well, That's fair the only enough. place where it exists. That's the only fair place enough, where, where the idea of Elvis's guitar can show up. Okay, well, I'm trying to figure out then, you see, because what seems to me to be happening, at least in part, is that the, we can stretch the the domain of what constitutes a fact so that the domain of facts starts to incorporate the domain of values. But we do that with some 
doing some damage to the domain of facts. No, no, no. Well, not hang, at all. hang on. Don't don't say. Don't just say no. It's, yeah, it's, well, it's this is really. Uh, I'll say is, more. This is yeah. really complicated because you see. Part of what the postmodernists have done is that they've pushed away the domain of facts entirely, and they yeah. say, "Well, the only thing is, is that the only thing that actually exists is that this domain of intersubjective agreement." And and they well, yeah, no, yeah, you and I are on the same page with respect to postmodernism. Right, yeah. but 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 you have to give but you have to give the you have to give the devil his due as well. Yeah. They they pointed out something, and, and what they pointed out is that it's not so easy to localize the structure that attributes to facts their value. It's not a simple thing. Now, wait, no. wait, wait. Yes. You would surely agree that if we had Elvis Presley's guitar, that that guitar would have a material impact on people. We could tell them, this is Elvis Presley's guitar, some fraction of them would disbelieve it, somebody might be able to establish it based on a picture or something like that. And the point is, it would have a, a value that would alter the behavior of people with respect to that object in a material way. Yes, it would alter the behavior of the people. So the it value could, be, could also be manifest be, in physical space. Which part of it? The we behavior? We could detect it. We could figure out what the yeah. value of this guitar is based on some intersection Sure, between. we could take a behaviorist approach and we could see how much work people were willing to do to, yeah, to but also make also contact we, with we the can, guitar. We can scan their brains and see what they see. Well, how, I'm not so sure we can do that. Well, well clearly the brain is involved. Hypothetically, we can do it, but yeah. practically we're not no, so good no. at it. Because the MRI data, generally speaking, is junk. Well, we, so, we, we, we can table that. That's, well, it's, that's, look, it's, it's, it's not like it'll be That will be a profoundly controversial it, statement it, in, well, in MRI it's not, circles. It's, yeah, but, the, yeah, fair I enough. Don't, I don't yeah. think we need it. We, we, we know, don't need it. But we know let's go with the that a market idea. will establish the, the, the value brain, of the, the brain, as yet incompletely understood, is surely involved in the valuing of this object. Right. And so if I, t if I tell you that this is, and again, we can take it out of intersubjective space because it could, you, you could be in a value solitude with respect to any given object. So it could just be, you could have a sentimental attachment to your watch that's worth exactly $25 because that's what you paid for it, but this is the watch that, you know, this is your first watch or whatever it is and you wouldn't sell it for any amount of money. Right. That's a measure of your, a behavioral measure of how much you value it. And if I told you, oh, well, you know, sorry, I, I borrowed your watch and lost it, what the cascade of negative affect that I see on your face is correlated with something that's happening in your head and the brain is, is, is involved, right? So that, the well, totality of that picture what you're basically stating, is the as value. As I can tell is that there, there'd be a socio-cultural agreement as to the value of whatever this entity is and that would find its mirror in the brain. And that, but, that's, that's a non-controversial statement it, because all socio-cultural phenomena that are experienced find their reflection in the brain. The fact that you can say that that's reflected in the brain it's like, right. yes, okay, but okay, the, but but the, pr the problem we, run, we continually run into with religion is that there, you have a domain of so-called sacred values where people who are otherwise rational cease to be rational actors. So this, the, the reason why Israel and uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians can't negotiate as though their problems could be solved by a real estate transaction is because they have irrational and irreconcilable claims upon land and buildings. Do you think they're any, Actually, more, I don't, I don't think they're any more irrational than the claim that that class is worth something well, more? Well, no, it's, it's just, it's near, just, no, no, it's, it's, it's near like near that. It's, 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 it's like that, but I'm, I'm but saying... But that's not irrational by your own definition. You just said that that was actually constituted a fact. Well, and no, so it's, it's, fact, a fa it's a fact about people, right? So, it, no, there, there are, well, this is, okay, okay. should be a little care careful here because yep, yep. it gets confusing. Yeah. The, the, there are, we can make objective claims about subjective experience, right? It's not, it's, it's, there are, we use this word objective and subjective in, in different ways. We use it in, in epistemological ways and ontological ways. And what Take, if, so, wait, give me just one sec to make sure I'm on the same page okay. as you. Well, so I'll, 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 I can illustrate by way of example. If I say that, you know, that's just your subjective opinion, right? I'm saying, I'm denigrating, I'm saying that, you know, this is an expression of your bias. This is, this, this is, this is true for you, but it's not true out in the world, right? That's one way I can use the, the subjective objective distinction. Uh, and that's an epistemological way. Like you're, you're, you're ruled by bias, you're not thinking straight, you know, I don't have to take your opinion seriously. That's subjective, I'm worried about objective facts. But people get confused, they think that objective facts only means the material world and what's, what the, what's really in this glass as a material object. No, we can be a, much more objective than that. We can, we can make objective claims about the subjective experience of, of people like ourselves. I can, I, can, I can make an infinite number of objective claims about 
the experience, this is the example I always use, but I, I just happen to love it. Uh, what, what was JFK thinking the moment he got shot, right? Now that's it, we don't know, so we'll never get the data, right? So the, 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 the truth or, or falseness of, of what I'm about to say can't be predicated on actually getting access to the data because, because he's not around to, and his brain's not around to scan. Uh, uh, so, but we, you and I both know an infinite number of things he wasn't thinking about. We can make a cl an objective claim about his subjectivity. I know he wasn't thinking, well, I, I hope Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris work it out on stage that <laughs> night. Right? And an infinite number of things like that. He was thinking something, he was experiencing something, but we don't know what it is. That, so I, so when, when I'm talking about this domain of value, I'm saying that, that, that it, it exists in the, this landscape of, of actual and possible conscious experience for human beings and any, any other system like us that can experience okay. this range of suffering and happiness. Well, okay, so, and partly what I'm trying to do is to actually determine what that structure is. Like, so well, in I, our I, case, it, it, it's certainly connected to the evolved structure of our brain. Yeah, but I want but to go way deeper into it's, the it's brain. It's augmented I, by I everything go, else we do. I want to go the, way deeper into it to the idea then it's connected with brain states because it's, yes, it's definitely connected with brain states. The question is, at least in part, how and what does that mean? And I think that the neuroscience has progressed far enough so that we can do quite a good job of this. And so, but I want to return to one thing and, and maybe I'll outline a little bit of this. And um, When you talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you said that that was irrational. And so, look, you know, fair enough, it, we, people have been locked with their hands around each other's necks there for 3,000 years. But there's a problem there. And the problem is that people are looking at the landscape from a contextualized perspective, right? It's not just a piece of land, it's their piece of land. It's like your house or maybe yeah. your favorite shirt. It's like, well, you say, well, I have a favorite shirt. It's like, well, there's nothing inherent in the shirt that makes it your favorite. No, it's a subjective judgment. It's like, well, then is that a fact? Well, yes, it's a fact. It's a fact about subjective judgment. It's okay. Well, the Israeli claim on the land and the Palestinian claim on the land is a subjective judgment that's a fact. Yeah, it's it, like, so how is it yeah, irrational? It, it, because it is the, the true analogy here, the complete analogy is rather like we're about to fight over Elton John's glass and Elton John was never here. <laughs> right. Well... So, so I, I, I'm not saying, so, so it clearly still matters to us. In, think, our, in our misapprehension of our situation, we still really care. And these are, these are objectively true claims about the level of, uh, at, at which we value things. And, the, and hence the impasse. Well, but it that, matters. I, if, I, if, I think if that's counterproductively dismissive. Like you could say, well, the, it's, it's, the it's really not. When you look at the specific <laughs> claims, it's really not. It's, well, it, Look, you took, you took the contextual interpretation to its absolute extreme. You said, well, there's multiple reasons why different people who occupy the same piece of land are going to feel about it in different ways. Sure. Okay, and, and, and mo most of those reasons are amenable to some kind of rational compromise. Well, I mean, this, there's actually, the, there, there know, are studies the, on this. I mean, there are well, studies done by people when, who, when you who say I the disagree word with. But. When you say the word rational in that context, you're using it as a black box that contains the concept, proper way of thinking about it. It's like, it's not so obvious in most situations what the rational approach is. Well, Otherwise, I have, life I, would be very, I have an very obvious simple. One, I have an obvious one here. Here, and, and, and that's that whatever th the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews think they're getting from their attachment to their dogmatic and irreconcilable religious worldviews can be gotten just as well by a, a deeper understanding of, the, of our universal and non-culturally bound capacity for ethical experience, spiritual experience, community building, and we can, so we can what's touch that, grounded, that space. What's that grounded in? We can touch that space what's without... That, because fine, it, it's fine. almost like the status quo is... It's almost like you're content to live in a world, or you're, at least you're content not to judge too harshly a world where fans of rival soccer teams or baseball teams regularly kill one another over their fandom. Right? Like, like what if that were the status quo? It's like, it's been this way for thousands of years. There must be a reason for it. Like, Look, people really like to, sports. I'm not trying to justify no. the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. No, but, I'm but saying that we shouldn't be too quick to, to judge to, the sanctity of their of their differences of opinion. Okay, but wait a minute, Sam. There, you made a claim. Like you, your claim was that 
if the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims would just stop their stupidity and adopt this universal ethic, then everything would be okay. It's like, right. okay, what's the basis for the universal ethic? Like, that's such... That, that's a non-problem. No one's ethic. going, to, no like, one's going in search of that. The truth is, I mean, that's an interesting problem for philosophers and for scientists. That's not actually where the rubber meets the road for people living their lives well. I mean, it, it, it's, it, this is analogous to me. Sure, sure like it is. Every, it's associated every, in your book ev, ev, with the difference between the bad well, no, and the good no, life. I, I really care about all of this, and, I, and I, my, my job as a, as a philosopher, as a moral philosopher in that case, is to make the best case I can for these ideas. But the truth okay. is, I mean, it's, it's, it is analogous to when, when you get into a debate with a, a Christian fundamentalist in the States, very often this per this person will pretend to care about cosmology as, or evolution as though it's the most important thing in the world, as though you can't get out of bed in the morning and figure out how to treat your, your friends and family well unless you figure out what happened before the Big Bang, right? No one really lives their lives that way, and yet we have convinced ourselves that this is a sensible way of talking about the, the, you know, the, the conflict between religion and science. So, hold, hold on. Put, I, yeah. think you, I think you have arrived at the core of your conflict right here. And I, I actually hear you both loud and clear. Mm. Um, your point is that if the people faced with the question were to, you know, start with a fresh sheet of paper, look at the Middle East, they could arrive at a compromise that they as individuals might find um, uh, put them way ahead and is more profitable than the situation that they are continually finding themselves in. Yeah. And that might be the case. On the other hand, the reason that they don't is that historically those who have have been outcompeted by those who haven't. So the point is, the universe and the fact that it refuses to solve that conflict is telling us that there is some reason that people who take that prospect seriously um, are not actually correct in some at least metaphorical way. So in other words, what is it to have a sentimental attachment to some piece of territory somewhere? That sounds completely irrational. On the other hand, that sentimental attachment may result in you continuing for 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years, whereas if you surrendered it because it was irrational, you might go extinct. Now, should you care that your lineage is going to go extinct? Maybe, arguably not. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine that what you're saying is so thoroughly grounded that it can justify causing people to alter their perspective on value in such a way that it might actually drive them extinct. It's not well, clear but, that that's a good clearly, thing. Clearly, I mean, secularism, I mean, we're, we're talking about the fringe here. We're talking about, the, the, when you're talking about, in this case, the Israeli settlers and the Palestinian terrorists, right? Like that is, that is there's, it, we should all breathe a sigh of relief that that doesn't, that, that, that kind of passion and attachment to land doesn't characterize most of humanity. It you does know, if it, you're trying to defend your house. So, well, but, but that's it, it, can it's I, kind can of I a different turn that topic. back on yes. Jordan because I think this is this is where this is where the the crux of it is. Well, so what, if if yes. we follow the idea that this is actually some that the seemingly sentimental and irrational attachment to the piece of land is some sort of meta rationality, which sounds like your perspective, then we are now confronted with the question of all right, if it is an evolved kind of meta rationality that is being manifest in stories that cause people to behave in ways that Sam sees as clearly irrational, then we are stuck with the naturalistic fallacy, which is to say, so for those who don't know, the naturalistic fallacy says that just because something is doesn't mean it ought, right? The fact that selection favors something doesn't make it good. When the Aztecs sacrifice their enemies, it is good for continuing Aztecness, but it may not be good in some absolute moral sense, so yeah. here's the question for you. Yeah. You're arguing for, a, I think, an evolutionarily very viable explanation for religious belief and dogma, but aren't you stuck with the downside of it where much of what is encoded in that way may actually be abhorrent morally yes. and consciously? absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, no do doubt we, about it. what do we do about well, that? Well, this is, this is exactly Do you have why a sorting I, algorithm? Yes. What is I'm it? I'm trying to get to it. Okay. Okay, so this is actually why I asked Sam this question. It wasn't, it wasn't an attack. It's like, okay, so look, people have these belief systems, Christian, Muslim, Jew, we'll say for that, and you're saying abandon those, let's say, to, to, and move towards this transcendent rationality. It's like, okay, two problems. Um, 
It's not so easy to abandon a belief system because you end up in the morally relativist nihilist pit. And well, that's a problem. One but doesn't have to. And, well, and many people, don't. people tend to, and it, so it's a well, very no, major I mean, problem. It's just not. I mean, so, that, no, no, that, they don't have to. Look, that's, wait, wait. Sam, that's, they, that's an empirical right. claim that we would we, we'd have to find out whether that's true, well, they but don't, there's they a don't. lot of evidence against that. Yeah, well, there's plenty of evidence for it, too, but it's beside the point to some degree, because I, that, isn't, that isn't something that I want to quibble about. There, perhaps there are, trans, there are transitional paths, and sometimes people find a collapse of their faith actually freeing. It's certainly the yeah. case that many of the people who are, are, are happy about what you're doing have found exactly that in what you've been saying, and more power to you, and so I'm, I'm not willing to dispute that. But what you said was, okay, here's these belief systems that are ancient and complex, and we can step outside of them, and there's this transcendent rationality that we could all aspire to that would solve the problems. It's like, okay, what is it? Well, like, what it, is it exactly? It, it is, at a minimum, to value all of the variables that conspire to make the one life we know we have Okay, you can't living. value all those variables. Well, no, we, we, we're doing it right. We do it every day in how we organize no, ourselves we don't, in society. No, because we apply an a priori framework to the variables to, to reduce them to a tiny subset that we can manage. And it's the nature of that a priori framework that we haven't been able to have a discussion about. We have an a priori it, framework that narrows our perception to almost nothing. It's built into us. It's partly socially constructed. It has a deep neurological substrate. And we actually understand how it emerges to a large degree. And the thing is, is that... But I, I, don't, think, I don't think that's actually our difference. I mean, so this, the a priori fr framework operates in many different spaces, which, again, we can't necessarily analyze, but it makes it no less true. So if you, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you will immediately feel a, good, a very good reason, in fact, an unarguably good reason, to remove it, right? And right. That's, it doesn't require uh, moral philosophy to get you there. You don't, need a, you don't need to inspect your a priori framework. You just have to feel, holy shit, this is the worst thing I've ever felt, right? And there's so many moments like that in life that we dimly, un that we understand so what sometimes... What if you're trying to rescue your child from a fire? Well, exactly. Then you, ha you have some other g goal, right? Yes, that is going to cause you to brave that, that suffering, right? Yes. And, but again, trying to rescue your child from a fire is pretty close to as... Uh, the hot stove in not needing to be analyzed, right? The, the imperative to rescue your... It, it, get, it becomes harder when you have to rescue someone else's child from a fire, and you're, and you're wor worried about orphaning your child who's standing next to you on the sidewalk, right? Then we get into the domain of moral philosophy, and then you can say, well, you know, what do, what, how much do each of us owe the children of other people, right? How much should I risk my life and risk orphaning my child to rescue your child? That's when things get interesting in a philosophy seminar, and that's where people begin to hesitate. People begin to, we, we are biased toward protecting ourselves, protecting our kin, protecting our friends, and only then do we begin to extend the circle. And, and again, moral, but this is not a, a mystery where we, we, we want to go here. We want to extend the circle more and more and build institutions and societies that, that, that implement our best selves at our best moments more and more. It makes it more effortless to be good in yeah, the but world. The we want good incentives. Can, devil, can we take your example details. seriously here for a second? Yeah. All right, so you are built to be more likely to rescue your own child than someone else's child from a fire. We in society might like for the minimum number of children to die in fires as possible, which gets you to sideline that consideration in favor of is there a child uh, who's faced with a fire who, I'm, who I might rescue. Religions do exactly this restructuring of values because they say something like, actually, your goodness in risking your own life to save that other child from a fire is observed and it is, it is calculated and you will be rewarded for it well, in some way. That's, that's, that's one possible benefit of some religions, right? Good. And... Again, so you put that on the balance, but I have a lot to put on the other side of the sure balance. Sure, you do. Right? I know you've got a never-ending list. Look, right. I yeah. want to. I want to. I want to. Well, which, which, that's what I'm yep. trying to point out to Jordan but, here, which he actually acknowledges, which is that he's got a big stack of good things that come from this heuristic. Well, but he's also acknowledging. But, but this is actually get this. This is our core disagreement here, which is however you want to. However, the balance is going to swing. I, I, the, the, the difference between us here is that I think we read the utility of, of, of anything, but in this case, religious thinking, 
as evidence of, you, you read it as evidence of something perhaps literally true. Inevitability. Depends okay. on what you mean yeah. by literally. Yeah, so, so, and I, I view that as a, a kind of version of either the genetic or naturalistic fallacy, that it's just, like, whether, whether that's, it's, it's useful now here for us, it doesn't, doesn't argue that it's the best way of getting those good things. I mean, the, my argument here is that religion gives people bad reasons to be good where good reasons are available. Okay, right? so, and, so... And that's a problem, right? right. And, and, and because good, re good reasons scale better than bad reasons. And I think we can under... Even if you take the case where religion is clearly useful in a life-saving, utterly benign way, uh, in, in virtually all of those cases, I think I, could, I can get you there by some other way without the, the downside. Or if not, that's just one of those cases where, yes, the fiction was more useful how than do, any possible truth. How do you truth. distinguish a religious system from an a priori perceptual structure? Well, if you can convert to it or away from it in a single conversation, I would say if it, it doesn't go very deep. Well, you're, you're only, I would say that for much of that, you're only converting at a very superficial level. Well, no. You're converting at the level of conscious apprehension, and most of your cognition is done through unconscious processing. Well, it, so it's superficial. It's just, it's just a fact about us that most of people's religious attachment is born of having it drummed into them by their parents. Right, if I mean, but the truth well, is... Well, no, their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' yes, parents' Yes, exactly, parents but if we did the same thing with Batman and Spider-Man, it would have the same effect, right? Like, if, if you relentlessly told children, right? I mean, I've, I've got, you know, two little girls who are, you know, dressed up like Batgirl right now. They love Batgirl. There's nothing... I don't have to do anything to make them more enthusiastic about superheroes apart from just showing them the pictures of superheroes, right? If I told them, in addition to how, look how fun this is to dress up like Batgirl, uh, in addition, you're, all, you're gonna burn in hell for eternity <laughs> if you lose your emotional attachment to Batgirl, even for a minute, right? Well then, it's gonna be Batgirl for the rest of their lives. <laughs> it, especially if the entire culture is, is doing likewise. And I, you know, again, this is... Well, as, have, as Eric, uh, as Brett pointed out already, a bad tool is better than no tool at all. And if Batgirl is the closest approximation to a divine figure that you can conjure up, it beats the hell out of none at all. And if Batgirl didn't well, partake of certain archetypal structures, no one would give a damn about Batgirl. Okay, I'm, I'm so gonna, Spider Man I'm, and Batman I'm gonna spare play, you. A role, play a role in the culture. All right. Because, yes. look, hold, hold it's on. not accidental. It's not accidental that superhero stories have a structure. Well, and to say that, well, Batman and Spider-Man are obvious fictions and we could use them as no, moral no, exemplars, no, no. which you're, we you're do. You're taking the wrong end, you're taking the wrong end of this. I, I'm, not, I'm not minimizing the power of stories. Right? I'm saying we can understand their power without recourse to believing things we shouldn't believe now in the 21st century. I, I still need an no. answer to the question about what it is that's this transcendent, transcendental rational structure without an a priori, uh, an a priori dogma, because well, well, I don't see it. Well, it's not, well, again, this, uh, we, we touched on this a little bit last night in that I freely admitted that in every domain of human inquiry, no matter how, I mean, the, the most hard-headed, so mathematics, logic, physics, at some point we have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. At some point we make a move that is not self-justifying and is not justified by any other move that's more rudimentary. Right, that's so, a statement of faith. That well, thing but, you know, just that's, laid but that's, out. A, that's a callow use of the term faith. No, it's not, it's not. not the it's same a precise kind of faith. definition of an no, axiomatic my, statement my of faith, faith. My faith that two plus two makes four. That's not faith. Well, no, it is. No, it's my intuition that this is a, a valid and replicable and generalizable principle, right? You give no, me that's two not object. faith either. Your statement that that's a useful claim is a statement of faith, but neither of those two were statements of faith. No, it was, statements they're, they're, of they're statements of fact. intuition. No, no, those, these, are, these are intuitions. These are in, because they're, and they're intuitions that can run afoul of other discoveries and other intuitions, as you know, which... Uh, well, if mathematical put, put, so, facts are intuitions, then what are we doing no, with facts? Know, so take, 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 so take, we, we've arrived no, 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 at the point where we have that to this, decide. This is super important, though. Okay, super important. Okay. okay, we don't lose this. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is, so we, for, what, 2,000 years, people have been studying geometry and had a very well-worked-out set of mathematical intuitions with respect to Euclidean space, you know, flat geometry. Mm -hmm. 
And then some brilliant guy, you know, Riemann might have been the first, said, well, actually, you can curve space. You know, I can bend this triangle, and all, all of a sudden it has more than 180 degrees, right? That's an intuition that people tuned up pretty quickly, but all of humanity was blind to it for the longest time, right? These are, what I mean by intuition is, it's the thing you're using to understand something that you you are not in a position to analyze. I understand now, that's, that. But that's not faith of the sort which is, listen, I know the Bible was dictated by the creator of the universe. I know Jesus was his son. I know he rose from the dead. I know he'll be coming back. And a thousand if other propositional a, claims if it's on, a statement uh, of that faith seem highly and it's implausible. Valuable. If it's a statement of faith and it's in the value domain, how is it derivable from fact? If okay, it's a, so... I, we've arrived at the point where we have to decide whether to go to Q&A or to continue the discussion. While you all are thinking about that, I would like to okay. level a challenge to each of you, and then I will poll the audience and see what they think about Q&A. Okay. Okay, so um, Jordan is arguing to you that you cannot ground the values that would undergird the modality of increasing well-being in anything factual. And you are arguing in response that... Not without the, an intermediary well, structure. Well, let me just argue in, in response. Well, hold, hold on a second. Right. Not without I, an intermediary structure. What I've heard you argue is something that I agree with, okay. which is that you can ground many things in a nearly um, objective observation of the universe, but it doesn't say anything about the value part of the equation. And in fact, I think, having thought about the question from an evolutionary point of view, that in order to do what you're talking about, to increase well-being, you are going to have to accept that that is going to leave you with an arbitrary grounding. There is no absolute grounding for it. And you're gonna to have to just simply accept that it's going to make you arbitrary, that you are in fact going to have to do no, inconsistent no, yeah. things like decide to honor the love of a mother for her child and dishonor the love of country that causes one population to, to gas another population. Right. That, that's inconsistent, and no, we no, need to embrace no. that in kind of inconsistency. I mean, it, it's just a different, it's a, I don't think that we even have the grounding problem. I think it's a pseudo problem. I well, think you, we, but you just said we, you we needed have, to put we, your staff no, in somewhere. We have a navigation, so my, the way it's grounded is the acknowledgement that what we have is, I mean, it's, a, it's analogous to what people do with the notion of, of meaning in life. Like, what's the meaning of life? How do you find meaning in life? Or what's the purpose of life? These are bad questions. These are questions that, by, when you pose them, they seem to demand, they suggest a space in which an answer must be put, but it's, it's just... It, but you it, put an answer there. No, you said no, that people should work towards the good. Yes, there's a, different, there's a different way of framing it, which is, what we have here is an opportunity. It's not, a it's not a matter of meaning. It's not a matter of purpose. And it's not a matter of grounding. It's a matter of we are in a, in a circumstance where, the, where we have consciousness and its contents in every moment. And all of this is, the, the, light, the lights are on, and they're on for reasons that we dimly understand, right? They, these are they're, they're, they're reasons that are biological in our case, but uh, perhaps at bottom they're just based on information processing and that they're platform independent and then we would build machines for whom the life the, the light is actually on or not right this is it remains to be seen whether we can actually build in our computers conscious minds that can thrive or suffer right and that the difference matters but we're in a circumstance where we are trying to understand how conscious consciousness and its states arises but one thing that is undeniable is that the lights are on, and being on, they reveal a spectrum of experience that, which has one end that we, the, the, the worse it gets, the more compelling it is to move away from it. That's re meaning. That's meaning, right? Yes. There. Okay. So, so, and then, and all of our meaning talk and value talk relates to navigating in this space. So there's, there's one end of it where things get needlessly horrible without a silver lining, mm -hmm. and there's another end where it gets better and better and non-zero sum right. and all boats are rising with the same tide and the Israelis and the Palestinians... That's the landscape of evil and good. Yeah, so, okay, so what do fine. You, what do these you are, do? That's why, so these are compelling ways to talk about this space of, of 
navigation. Yep. What do you do when you accept your space of navigation and there's a conflict between well-being for the living population of Earth right. versus well-being over the maximum populations that could possibly live into the future? When there's yep. a big conflict between how much well-being we are going to feel now versus how much well-being future human beings will get to feel. Yeah, well, that, that those are legitimate ethical problems which I, mean, we, I think we often live in the space where we know there's a right answer that we are too selfish to fulfill or too short-sighted to fulfill. Like, so I know there are things I do every day that not only will other people as yet unborn wish I hadn't done, I might wake up tomorrow wishing I hadn't done those things, right? So like I'm a, I, I'm a bad friend to my future self in some respect to say nothing of the rest of humanity. So we can be, so we can have failures of, we can have weakness of will, we can have failures that we can just be wrong about certain things, but it's nowhere written that it's easy to be a good person, right? But in we, that case, it's not even clear what good means. Well, no, I think, no, it is clear. I'm saying Brad, even in those I cases where we that. know so, the answer, it might be hard to be motivated by that knowledge. And that because we're not a unity, right? I mean, part of, part of what wisdom is morally is an ability to, to, be, to live integrated enough with your own you know, better self, you know, the advice you would give to a friend, I mean, this, this just falls right out of your work as well. It's like li live as though, but basically treat yourself the way you would treat, I think this is your line, so, you know, someone you're, you're responsible for or there's someone, a friend of yours, right? If you, can, if you can do that, you're already ahead of who most people are most of the time. But there's no, there's no reason to say that because it's difficult or because sometimes we're looking through a glass darkly and can't figure out what the answer is, the answer doesn't exist or there is no right one. Okay, now let me try with you. You, <laughs> yeah, um, so Jordan, you have argued for uh, an evolved framework of religious belief in which there are elements that are morally defensible that will be carried through time, there are elements that are morally reprehensible that will be carried through time by virtue of the fact that they are effective. Um, and you have argued that these things, because they have withstood the test of time, um, have some kind of value, which do, is not necessarily something that we should honor, but some large fraction of it must be. Mm -hmm. But that would seem to suggest that the degree to which these belief structures has value is contingent on the degree to which the environment in which we attempt to deploy these structures matches the environment in which they evolve. Absolutely. Now, I would argue that no population of humans has lived farther from its ancestral environment mm -hmm. than we do. Yeah, I think that's a fallacy. You think so? Yeah. Because well, it is and it isn't. And, and look, I think that's an a, 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 a absolutely valid point. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this gets esoteric relatively rapidly, but... The question is, let's say at the highest levels of adaptation, we're adapted to the things that last the longest periods of time. Okay, those are the most permanent things. Now the question is, what are those most permanent things? And you know, one answer would be the fundamental material substrate of the world. And I, that's true, I'm gonna leave that be. Like, we're evolved to deal with gravity, okay. But there are other elements that are higher order abstractions in some sense that are also apparently hyper real. So, for example, there's, there's a problem that we have a bifurcated brain. The question is, well, why do we have a bifurcated brain? And the answer seems, and not just us, animals too, the answer seems to be, well, there's two necessary ways of looking at the world, and they have to be in conflict to some degree in order to work properly, the right hemisphere mode and the left hemisphere mode. The right hemisphere mode is a lot more metaphorical than the left hemisphere mode. The right hemisphere is the hemisphere that seems to deal with exceptions to the rule. And it seems to deal with the exceptions to the rule by, by treating them, by aggregating them and then trying to recognize patterns that unite them as a corrective to the totalitarian system in some sense that the left hemisphere imposes. You could say that the right and the left are adapted for something like explored territory for the left and unexplored territory for the right. I've characterized that as order versus chaos. And I, I think the religious landscape is good versus evil, to Sam's point, that we should strive for a good life, on a landscape of chaos versus order. And I think that landscape is permanent. Now, I know we've moved from our African ancestral homeland, but these, this underlying 
abstraction. This underlying, un this underlying reality is so profound that it, it, it maintains its validity across all sets of potential environmental transformations. Well, okay. Okay, can I just jump in here? Because here's why, <laughs> just to seize on one piece you, you put in play there, here's why good and evil can't be permanent. In the, in the usual sense, certainly not in the Christian or Judeo-Christian sense. One is the, the Judeo-Christian notion of good and evil doesn't even map on to, to Eastern but religion. But Sam, you made a good evil versus good well, versus no, evil but, claim no, in the moral landscape. No, but, it, so. but, it, but it's also in, in an Eastern context, in a Buddhist or Hindu context, the evil isn't really evil, it's just ignorance. Now you might dispute that, you might say, well that's not really, they haven't met a sufficiently evil person to, if they could think that. but. The but reality you, is, is, is pointed, that, 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 that there are billions yourself. of people who have a different rubric under which they yeah, look but at these Sam, things. Sam, you, can't, but, have, you but, can't make that but, case. But, but, but let me add another, another okay. piece here, wait, which wait, is... Wait, wait. We, we need okay. to ask them. Okay, okay. Yeah, want, we need, you guys need to vote. Do you guys want this okay. conversation to continue, or do you want Q&A to begin? <laughs> I don't know which one you're cheering for. Give them a pause and ask about q First group is the group that wants this conversation to continue. Okay. Well, and now, the group that would prefer Q&A. Okay, well, it was the former. There, what, what's disturbing is that many of the same people were clapping. <laughs> that, that proves what Jordan was just saying about the two hemispheres of the human brain. Okay, okay beliefs, so, well, so, so look, I mean, I, it seems to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you made an absolute moral claim in the moral landscape, mm -hmm. and that's what grounds your Here, argument. Okay, the absolute moral well, let's claim Let's just is take this evil piece, because it'll be interesting if it's not totally on point. Okay. The reason why evil is susceptible to total deflation is, if you agree with me, uh, evil is a category of human misbehavior, human intention, that we don't understand significantly at the level of the brain, but if we did understand it totally at the level of the brain, then every evil person we had in the dock at trial would be just like Charles Whitman with his brain tumor after he shot up everyone at uh, the University of Texas, right? So like, he, he's, at, he's the prototypically evil mass murderer, but he's complaining about uh, this change that overcame his personality and he thinks it would be good. It would be a good idea that if after the cops kill me, you autopsy my brain because I don't know why I'm doing any of this, right? And lo and behold, he had a glioblastoma pressing on his amygdala, and all of a sudden, it made sense of his behavior in a way that a full understanding of psychopathy or every other variant of human evil would make sense of it in a way that would be deflationary ethically. Okay. And, then, and then you would look at so then you look at someone like Saddam Hussein, or the the, the, the worst evil person you could imagine, and you would say, well. He's actually unlucky. You know, there but for the grace of biology, go I. Because if I had that brain, if I had those genes, if I had those influences that gave me those synapses, I would be just like him. Now, if you think there's some other element that gives us free will, and, and now, then, then, then you and I are disagreeing, then that's a factual claim that's at variance with mine. Yeah, but, but, okay. but if we are just, on some level, Mal malfunctioning biological systems when we're being evil, then a complete understanding of evil would cancel that category can you ethically. Can you define evil so we know what you're talking about? Well, just I mean, take, take the, just the worst people who have sadistically victimized the most people, and those are the, the evil, evilest people we can name. So, 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 so when you yeah. say, so I, I think this is actually really important, because I think actual evil of that kind is pretty darn rare, and there's a lot of badness that emerges yeah. Oh, yeah. from... Well, the most troubling thing are all the good people doing evil because they, they're ruled by bad ideas. But that, okay. that, I think, is more consequential than we, actual we introduced, evil people. We introduced a whole set of other things here in the last little round about, well, about but, free will and evil. But, 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 just but to, I just want to make it clear why I, I went there. So you were saying this is, this is, this is I forgot the word you used, uh, inevitable or ineluctable or it's permanent. The implication is that this category is permanent. And I'm saying that, that I don't think okay, but evil on, in that sense is a permanent okay. category for us. Okay. It awaits more information and, and insight. Okay. We're going to distinguish for a minute good versus evil and good versus bad, just for the sake of conceptual clarity. In the moral landscape, you make a fundamental axiomatic claim. 
looks like a moral claim. Maybe yeah. it's a claim of fact. And the claim is there are bad lives and good lives. Sure. And the claim you make is that that's universally true. Well, it's, it's, so it's, it's true for the, the requisite Buddhist, minds. Buddhist, no. Hindu, oh, yeah, Christian, yeah, okay, doesn't but, matter. Okay, but evil, so yes, I'm not, I'm not telling you that you should purge the word evil from your, your vocabulary. I use the word all the time, and I think it's, it's useful. It's a motivating word. I'm just saying that it's, okay. there, we can understand this continuum of good and bad, or positive and negative, in ways that don't, Use the, 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 certainly don't use the Judeo-Christian framework for valuing these things. Because if you, if you take the Buddhist framework and map it onto this, this continuum, you don't get good and evil. You get essentially wisdom and ignorance. And evil is ignorance of all the well-being you, would, you and others would experience if you behaved another way. Right, that's the Buddha's game. And, and, or even within Hinduism. And they get, this connects to your... your the, your love of stories. You take the, 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 the Hindu text, the Ramayana, which is just a foundation, it's, you know, it's, it's doing the work that the Bible is doing for Jews and Christians in that the worst guy in the Ramayana, the ten-headed demon Ravana, the prototypically evil person, is at bottom really not a bad guy. He's a great sage who is just, you know, in a bad mood, essentially, right? I mean, he, was, he, was, he was obscured by ignorance. And so it is in the Buddhist canon. The, Buddhist meet, the, the Buddha meets a, a serial killer who you know, was wearing a garland of human fingers around his neck uh, named Angulimala, but he was just one conversation away from being fully enlightened, right? I mean, he was like, this is, it's a different picture of, of, of possibility. I'm not saying one is right or wrong. Let's be agnostic about that. I'm just, I'm challenging your claim that there's something so prescient and useful and durable about the Judeo-Christian framework. Making, I wasn't making that, we're, that claim. We're, we're, in this we're stuck context. with it for all time. Well, you I see, wasn't but, making that claim. I was making the claim that in the moral landscape, you laid out a distinction between the bad life and the good life. Forget about good right. and evil. The bad life and the good life. Hell and heaven. The bad life and the good life. And that that distinction was not only factual but universal. And so well, it's, it's, you, it's you universal made that given the right mind. So we could imagine a mind. I mean, this is an example. Okay, I think, I think I give, in a right mind. Yeah, yeah, no, no but, but we, could, we could create circumstances that seem perverse to us, that we would, would recoil from. You could, you could create a, a universe of perfectly matched sadists and masochists, say, right? So you have the people who are real sadists, who in our world would be terrible actors, but in their world, they're surrounded by people who want to be mistreated. Now, again, this If may, you're a real sadist, you never mistreat a masochist when he asks well, you to. Okay, well, <laughs> these are... <laughs> Right, granted. I, I, I'm not. Sorry, I'm not, sorry, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure the human categories Could, even exist. Couldn't but, resist. Uh, uh, but in some, we undoubtedly we could create something like an artificial intelligence that could be could, could be paired this way, uh, and that would be weird. But on my in my framework, it is a conceivable space of equivalent well-being. And it's, it's not matched at all to our space, right? But it's if, if, in fact, we could inspect the conscious minds of all parties participating in that, it is not obviously absurd, by, in my view, to say that they are just as happy as we are in this conversation. In fact, okay. some moments in this conversation, I would say that they might be happier. <laughs> no, it's but, been yeah. good. It's been yeah. good. So let me, let me ask you a question here about well-being, because this is something I wanted to ask you about, but we never seem to get to. Okay. Is, so you think that we should maximize well-being, and that's part of your proposition, which, which I don't entirely disagree with, by the way, that we should ground our value structures in facts. But, but, but there's a black box problem there, like, I think, the black box problem about the a priori structure that we use to extract the facts of the world out. And the, the black box problem is, if we could measure well-being, it's like, yeah, that's a big problem, Sam. Like, we have measures of well-being, and they're terrible. Yeah. Like, if you, yes, oh, yeah. they are. If no, you no, take, no, 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 I, I'm agreeing. I, I, don't oh, think, okay. I don't think it's, but it's not a problem for my thesis. It's, it, we don't have well, measures for anything we care about, really. Yeah, but I mean, if, if, you're, if your you, thesis you, is that if we had the measures of well-being that were appropriate, we could use them in a positive way, and the response is, but we don't have those measures. It's like, well, okay, well, then what do we do? Oh, no, no, we, we have, but we have measures. I mean, this con conversation is a measure. I don't like that. That's a measure. Right? You step on my toe and I say, ow. 
That's a measure. Don't do that again. But that's not a measure of your well-being. It might be a measure of your trait neuroticism. Well, well it, it's, a me, it's a measure of... And, but I mean that... These, I mean are, that, these are non-points. No, no, but I mean, this be, yeah. I mean this technically. Yeah. If you look at the well-being measures that we have, yes, they degenerate it, into measures of neuroticism. No, no. That's we, all we, they are. We don't, we don't, but we don't have measures of certainty, of belief, of compassion, of joy, of I mean, any, any of these conscious states, we have, we have neural correlates of some of them, but we don't have, well, we, uh, there's no well, then how helmet use, I can put on how you. How do so we hold, use hold facts on. about them to orient ourselves in the world then? Because we're doing, that, we're doing this all the time. You're, 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 if, You've if, got an instantaneous measure though. You've got an instantaneous measure of well-being. We can all check with ourselves, see how we feel. But and it's possible to be wrong about that. Right? Always, yes. sure. okay. always wrong. Sure. Yes. Um, but uh, it degrades as you get away from the individual's ability to check internally. On the well, other even hand, the, internal, the internal thing isn't reliable it's because not lots reliable of times you're happy when you're doing things well, that are terrible sure, and for you yourself. You could take a drug that would make you feel very good and would cause you to take apart your own life because it would You mean remove, like cocaine, for right, example. It would, it would destroy the, the motivational structure that gets you to do stump, stuff of value that uh, that you're right. So we in. can't use emotion, moment right. to moment emotion, as an indicator right. of well-being. Right. The instantaneous is True. not good, but no. you have a parallel problem. It looks to me like the exact mirror image, which is that you've got a, an integrative, long-term measure of well-being instantiated in an evolutionary belief system, but it's coming apart because we are living in circumstances that are less well mirrored. Uh, the, the present does not mirror the past, and therefore these yep. truths, which you you believe are timeless, mm. are degrading yep. rapidly. That's part of their. That's exactly right. Yes. Okay. So, what Sam is arguing is that the tools to pivot in order to improve our way of interacting, those are not the tools of long-standing tradition. Those are the tools of rational engagement. Respect for that process is part of the long-standing tradition. Yes, that's true. Yeah, but, but that's a big truth, man. I agree. That's a major league truth. I, I agree. And in fact, I would say the fundamental tradition, the most fundamental tradition of the West, says that respect for the process that updates moral judgment is the highest of all possible values. And that's also built into the tradition, strangely enough. I agree it's built into the, into the tradition, but I would argue that it is very likely to be compartmentalized. In other words, I was a little bit struck when you said that, um, what did you say about scaling? You said that uh, these... Well, well, we, we, that, Good reasons scale and bad reasons don't. Isn't that the opposite of the truth? <laughs> no, no. no because if you're calling, if you're calling these well, stories it, it, that give prescriptions for how to behave bad ideas, the point is those stories propagate very easily. Well, so whereas, so if we want to talk about the gun and whether it is loaded, mm -hmm. the idea that the gun is definitely loaded, that scales really easily, right? You can pass that along in one sentence. Yeah. And, and the, conse get it. the consequences On the other of being hand, wrong about a loaded gun also scale, right? So no, no, well, no, they, no, no. Well, if should. you want to talk to people about very small possibilities of very dire things happening, they trip over it. It's a hard thing to get. It's almost impossible for children right. to get it. So the point is the one thing does scale, a story that says, yeah, every gun is loaded. It's a false story, but that one definitely scales. Yeah. The statistical reality of guns and the fact that they may indeed be unloaded, but you don't want to play around with the remote possibility that one day you'll get it wrong, right? That doesn't scale because it requires you to have experience with stuff that is not common. Right. Well, so, so there are two things here. One, one, you bring up a, an ancillary but very important point, which is that moral progress here uh, is often the result of moving from our story-driven, protagonist-driven intuitions to something far more quantified, right? So, I mean, this is, this is a classic, you know, moral study done by Paul Slovak, who I'm sure you are, are aware of, where, you know, you, you tell people about one needy little girl in Africa, and you give her a name and, and, and show her picture, and what you elicit is the maximum altruistic, compassionate response from subjects. You go to another group of subjects, you tell them about the same little girl, give her the same name, but also tell them about her needy little brother, right, who has the same need, and their response diminishes, right? Just the addition of a single person uh, diminishes the response, and this is just, this is a, a moral fallacy that we're all living out every day, because if you care about this one little girl, you should care at least as much about the fate of her and her brother. 
And when you add statistics no, to it... No, you shouldn't, because well, you'll no, exhaust you yourself. No, you this shouldn't, is a because bug, you'll exhaust... Not a Man, you'll exhaust yourself in the attempt. No, because we need... What, we, are you going to no, care no, for 100 but, people but, but with this, the same intensity is, but, that you but care here, for one? This is, what this, this is what this software flaw gets us. It gets us people who will watch for hours a day with, with, with effortless and, and you know, tear-stained compassion the, the, the saga of the little girl who fell down the well, but who will blithely turn the channel when they're hearing about a genocide that, that is raging and hundreds yeah, of thousands Sam, have already died. Sam, right? listen, guys. We, if you, this, is a, this is something we have to... Let, if you let this, the We have to correct horror, for this. No, you, no. I'm not talking the, about person... No, but you're, misunder, you're misunderstanding me to great effect here. That if, I'm not saying that you should personally be overwhelmed by the death toll every day. You, I'm not saying that it's, it's functional for you and I to each personally get up each morning and just drink deep of the full horror of all the bad luck that has spread. No, maybe it world. is, but maybe right. we can't handle but at, it. But as societies, we need, when you're talking about how we, apport, how we spend our money, how we get a portion foreign aid, the kinds of wars we fight or don't fight, yeah. the kinds of inter then we have to correct for what is in fact a moral illusion, which is we know that if we tell one little, we, 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 we tell one compelling story about a little girl, right, we could go to war over that, right, whereas we won't be motivated by a genocide. That's the kind of thing that moves whole societies now. And if, it, if, it's, if you add to it the bogus religious sanctities, if, you, if, if, you, if we burned a Quran on this stage tonight, the rest, of our, the, yeah, the rest of our lives would be spent in hiding, right, because of how motivated people would be to, to, to address that pseudo problem, right? That's the world we're living in. And, we're, and civilization, insofar as we have a purchase on it, is a matter of correcting for those errors. And yeah, but, but religion, the problem, no. in, for the most part, not across the board, but for, for the most part, is standing in the way of those course corrections. Well, okay, there, there is a tremendous amount to in, unpack in that. I mean, and, and like, like in some sense a surprising amount. It's like, well, we have, we're, we're wired to feel intense empathy for individuals who are close to us, and we can be told stories in a manner that, that makes that system manifest itself. And everyone and their dog thinks that that's a wonderful thing, and we call that empathy, right? And empathy has a narrow domain of utility, as it turns out, because yep. how, I mean, maybe if you were all who you should be, you'd be weeping constantly for the catastrophic fate of sentient beings on the earth, but you can't handle it, you know what I mean? It's that you can barely handle your own suffering, and maybe you can handle a bit of the suffering of your family, and more power to you if you, you could rectify that, and if you were better human beings, maybe you could expand that outwards. But the fact that our empathy doesn't scale up to the level of genocide with the same intensity that we treat instances of individual suffering isn't an indication that we're irrational. It's just an indication that we're limited. Well, no, uh, uh, actually no, not I think right. this That's is, not true. I think this is an indication of exactly the problem of our evolved structures not matching the present. Because the point is... Well, they do point, match because we take care of our families. No, but they don't match because if you encountered the starving girl, that's some sort of a... Uh, it's a crude measure of suffering in your local environment were you in the past. Now that you can encounter this girl on the television, it's not clear what it should mean to you. Right. Right? You can't calibrate how many... It might mean get your act together. Right. And so the, so the point is, your um, indifference to a genocide, which is an abstraction, right, is altered should you see pictures of the bodies, for example. You shouldn't actually feel differently about the genocide in the abstract case versus the the case that you're looking at the bodies, and the fact that we have access to photorealistic well, well, representations maybe you should, of these things. Is no, but, but it's worse than that. Otherwise. This is why it's actually irrational, because I can show you the case where you care at level 10 about the little girl named Leela, and you care at level 8 uh, about the little girl named Leela and her brother named Jonti, right? And you care at level 4 if I've added a few more kids, but the little girl named Leela, who you ostensibly care about, is there in each one of these, right? So it yeah, is irrational. Yeah, but your resources are dimi diminished. No, but like you have the multiplication you have, of the suffering. You have ten dollars to give away every month to help start struggling humanity, 
and you tell me you'll give 10 to Leela this month. And, I, and, and then I catch you in another moment, and I say, well, you know, it's Leela and her brother, so it's like, if you only can give 10, uh, I understand, but, you know, it's, it's, the problem's actually worse than I suspected. And you say, well, not, actually, I'm just going to give eight, right? You, it, it's, it's not coherent with your, how much you well, cared about well, Leela in the first yeah. place. We do, know, we do know quite well that the heuristics that we use to orient ourselves in the world can be placed into frameworks where they produce contradictory outcomes. But that doesn't mean that the heuristics themselves are deeply flawed. It's, the, it's a problem with the work of people like Kahneman and Tversky. Yeah, is they we, take we perfectly need to, valid we need to heuristics. For them. We need to correct for them because they're, they're producing a reliable result that we, we recognize Yeah, but no, is, you can put them in a situation where they produce a counterproductive response, but that doesn't mean that generally speaking in most situations they don't produce a useful outcome because the question is why in the hell would have they evolved if they didn't produce a useful yes. outcome most they, of the time. They evolved to live with 150 people with, with whom we're related and to be terrified of the people in the next valley who may want to kill and eat us. Yes, right? and that's, that, I mean, that's, that's our ancient circumstance, right. which doesn't map onto a, a common humanity of 7 billion people trying to figure out how to get to Mars without you know, killing each other. Well, it, it does map onto it sometimes, unfortunately, because there are many times when we still face the same kind yeah, of but threats. In but fact, that, but hence, look, but, but it maps onto, this is the hierarchy maps onto that we're, your we're concerns, trying to climb Sam. Here. You wouldn't be concerned about uh, the fundamentalist terror of Islam if you weren't driven by those essentially tribal considerations. No, and I'm not it, suggesting it's not that it's wrong. It doesn't require... If my... A, a mere identification with humanity it can ground not wanting to be murdered by people who are identified with a subset of humanity, right? Like, I, I don't need to be part of a smaller tribe to care that people will murder me over burning a Quran, right? It's, it, it's just, it's clearly counterproductive that we live in a society where some objects are held with such totemic attachment for irrational re reasons by many, many millions of people where you know, uh, that you should be sympathetic with this. Our free speech is actually cancelled on this point, right? I mean, yes. We literally can't produce cartoons. Look, I there have, are scholarly I have, works look, about the cartoon prices we, we, that don't show the cartoons. We have no argument whatsoever okay. so between if, us so about the lack of utility of you, certain You don't have to be identified as a, as a Christian or a Jew to push back against that. You just have to be a human being that sees the dysfunction of a smaller kind of provincialism. Well, the thing that I'm struggling with is that I still can't understand in what your ethos is, is, is grounded. Because you, you claim a, like a transcendental rationalism, but you won't identify the structures that produce it. It's a black box. And when I try to push you on the absolute nature of your ethical claim, which is that the bad life is worse than the good life, and that we should, in fact, universally work towards the good life, it doesn't seem to me that you'll accept the proposition that that's a universal claim. It, it, no, it is. It is. Well, I, should is irrelevant here. It's just the fact that there is the possibility of, of moving in this space. If you move in the wrong direction, if you mo move far enough, you'll like it less and less. But why right? is should g irrelevant? G give, given, the, given the minds you have, well, right? But, well, I what, thought what if you had to, What if you had to accept moving in the wrong direction and experiencing less and less well-being in order to... To get to a better place. In, well, in, yeah. maybe even just to survive. Suppose the, suppose a population has to endure a generation and a half yeah. of misery in order to persist <clears throat> yeah. for another e hundred Ethically, years. that's a perfectly intelligible circumstance that people have had to face. And it's... Uh, in my, on my moral landscape, it's analogous to, I mean, we're, we're, we might be at one local maximum or, so, or the, some high point, uh, but we're moving in a down a slope to get to yet some higher place, right? So certain things, only, some things may only be possible if we made some painful and net unpleasant sacrifice that's to get there. That's for sure. Yes. And so that, but that's, that can be rationally apprehended. There can be an argument for that. It could be, you know, we all, you know, we all have to go on a diet. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to die of this problem, right? We all have to stop eating whatever it is, wheat, right? It's a hard sacrifice for people who have to stop it, as you know. Uh, if that were just true, well, then there'd be an argument for it. There'd be evidence that would convince us. We would stop. We would feel the pain, and we would, we would get whatever benefit that was on the other side of that sacrifice. But, again, you don't have to... If the utility, again, to come bring it back to stories which is, as you know, not my emphasis, but it is yours. The, the utility of stories 
is not something I'm arguing against. I mean, there's no question that certain stories are incredibly compelling, and in our conversation with one another, the moment you begin to frame something in terms of a story, people become much more interested, right? Like, if, if, if 90% of what we said together tonight were framed, each, each point we were making as a matter of philosophy or, or, or science were framed in, well, actually, you know, yesterday I was walking down the street and I met this guy, he was a terrifying looking guy, and all of a sudden people become much more interested, right? And then that's not an accident. And that says something deep about us that we could understand in evolutionary terms, and we might, in fact, want to creatively leverage to be better people yes. and to have better conversations. Definitely. Yes. So we, so that's what I think. There's I'm nothing. Doing. There's nothing that I say in opposition to religious dogmatism and religious sectarianism that discounts that reality, and that's a psychological reality. It's a cultural reality, and I'm not against making the most of it. My my basic claim, however, is that we never need to believe that one of our books m may not have a human origin in order to do that effectively. You can, you can be just as compelled by the example of somebody like Jesus or some more modern person who, who strikes you as a moral hero and, a, and deeply wise without uh, believing anything on insufficient evidence. And, if, and, and as, I, you know, as you alluded to, purely fictional stories about superheroes can have immense effect on us. And that's something we could understand and also leverage. But again, that takes us out of the religion business and that's, that's all I've been arguing for. So do you really believe that, um, <laughs> that the belief in the supernatural aspect of these stories never alters the calculus of what people should do? that the divine nature of a story about Jesus doesn't motivate people to do something that they might not have the courage to do otherwise, the belief that they might end up in heaven because their good work is going to be observed doesn't alter their behavior? Well, yeah, I know it alters their behavior, but, but rather but often for the bad. Well, no, I mean, th this, is what, this is what worries me about... I, mean, I think there's something... Th there's a profound net negative that we are pay paying the price for every day by believing in paradise, right? A belief, a belief that this life, it probably doesn't matter very much at all because we get what we really want after we die is, forget about the evidentiary basis for that belief, it, it, it is, it's ruinous for prioritizing what we should be prioritizing in this life. And it, I agree with that, by the way. Yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So... Um, let me ask you this. I hear from you what might be a kind of confirmation bias, where I hear that, you know, we've got a mixed bag. You've got supernatural claims. These supernatural claims, we all agree, have effects on the way people actually behave. And you're quite focused on the negative, and you tend to discount the positive, which might be an artifact of the fact that we're talking about the present and therefore maybe something that's not well matched to these stories or it might be from the idea that you have the sense that there is actually a bias that these belief structures do and have always produced more harm than good. So and, and also my sense that the positive can be had without those structures. So the, if you're talking about the, 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 the contemplative experience, you know, like is it possible to, to, feel, to wake up tomorrow morning feeling like Meister Eckhart, right? Feeling like you're just inseparable from the pure capital B being that is consciousness, right? And, and there's no separate self there, right? A self-transcending union with everything you can perceive, right? I think that can be had without any kind of religious dogmatism. That's just a matter of paying close enough attention to the nature of consciousness. So the contemplative life is, the ba is one baby in the bathwater we can save. The ethical life is another baby we can save. You don't have to presuppose anything on insufficient evidence to argue about what is right and wrong and good and evil in, in the 21st century. And that's, so, so is it fair to call that a hypothesis that not just for some people, but for everyone, the level of well-being can be enhanced through rational interaction with the questions that dictate what we do? Is that a hypothesis? Well, if that's a hypothesis. The, the, the one additional fact that we that makes that 
more or less moot is that on certain points, even if we felt that really believing the fiction were what was, was advantageous to people, depending on which fiction you're talking about, there's simply just there's too much evidence against it. You can't, you can't decide to believe something for which you have no evidence simply because of the good effects, it, the, the, the good experience it will give you or you imagine it will give you. I mean, that's, that's why Pascal's wager never made any sense. I mean, you can't say, I mean, the only way you can believe something to be true, really true, not just metaphorically true, is to believe that if it weren't true, you wouldn't believe it. That you, you stand in some relationship to its truth such that that is the reason why you believe it. Now, you can't say, you can't be telling yourself, you know, I have no evidence for this thing, but I know life would be better if I believed it to be true, and so therefore I really believe it's true. So you don't you think people do that all the time? I don't think they do. I think they do things much more like we're talking, the metaphorical truth we're talking about. We act as if things are true without forming any strong propositional claim, and that's fine. That's fine. That, that has its own utility. I mean, you, this, don't, you don't think this is basically, I mean, we all suspend disbelief when we go and watch a movie and we sort of entitle the movie maker to, um, to set the ground rules of the space and if it's Harry Potter then there are magic, magical right. things that can happen and if it's some other story maybe there aren't. So we all have a mechanism whereby we know we can suspend disbelief and it's interesting to me that you seem not to imagine that people are doing that with respect to metaphysical beliefs that have implications for what the right actions that they should take are. Why, why wouldn't it be the case that that same sort of mechanism would apply? Well, it, it does apply, but there are people who are clearly doing much more than that. I mean, the, the, so I'm not, if, if that's all people were doing under the aegis of religion, I wouldn't spend much time worrying about religion. I mean, that, to some degree, that's what people do, you know, as you say, going into caring about things that at bottom we really shouldn't care about. So the World Cup is on right now, and we, we you know, Literally, billions of people care care down to their toes what happens to this little ball as it traverses a, a lawn, right? And if it goes into the net, it really matters. And if it fails to, it really matters. And it always matters if we hit the target, Sam. But this is this is something we have manufactured to care about, right? No, it's, it's game, something that speaks it, to us. It's, it's quite deeply. literally a game. This is a game that people are playing, but some people take it in taking it further than you than than seems truly rational is part of the fun that's but but the but the people who can't turn that it's off it's a metaphor the, soccer's a metaphor yeah but there but there are people who there you know there are people you know the the fullback who kicks an own goal and then goes back to his you know south american village and gets murdered right he's surrounded by people who are taking the game too seriously yeah right? okay and, i i agree yes yeah, and so my problem with religion is that so much of the time we're meeting those people and we're, and, we're, yes. and we're not criticizing those people. We have no place to stand to criticize those people because we're so attached to the game. Fair enough. Look, why don't we, why okay. don't we do this? Why don't we each take three minutes to sum up? So I think, like yeah, we are there. We are uh, at the end of time. So why okay. don't you each take three minutes, sum up, and then we'll call it good. Yep. Okay. Um, sure. Okay. Sam went last. Do you want to go okay. first here? Okay. So, there's lots of things about which Sam and I agree, but the devil's in the details, of course. You know, I, I'm very sympathetic to his claim that we need to ground our ethical systems in something solid and demonstrable. My problem is, I'm not sure how to do that. When I've I don't believe that you can derive a value structure from your experience of the observable facts. There's too many facts, you need a structure to interpret them, and there isn't very much of you. And so part of the reason, part of the way that that's addressed neurologically is that you have an inbuilt structure. It's deep, it's partly biological, it's partly an emergent consequence of, of your socialization and you view the world of facts through that structure, and it's a structure of value. Now that structure of value may be derived from the world of facts over the evolutionary time frame. 
but it's not derived from the world of facts over the time frame that you inhabit, and it can't be. So the problem I have with our discussion so far isn't really any of Sam's fundamental ethical claims, because I do believe there's a distinction between the hellish life and the heavenly life, say, the life that everyone would agree was absolutely not worth living and the life we could imagine as good. And I do believe that we should be moving from one to the other. The question is exactly how is it that we make the decisions that will guide us along that way? And I don't believe we can make them without that a priori structure. In fact, I think the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that we can't, and I mean also the scientific evidence. And I would like to go further into the devil that's in those details. And so that's my <clears throat> situation at the moment. Yeah. Part of these conversations, and now we've, you and I have had, I think, four conversations. We've done two podcasts, and this is our second mm -hmm. live event. And uh, thank you for doing this, by the way. This is it's hey, it's my pleasure, man. It's an honor to do this. Uh, it's an honor to do this, and it's uh, it comes with risks for both of us to do this. I mean, the, as I think you can sense, we don't have precisely the same audiences. All of you are sort of rooting for one or the other of us to some degree. Uh, or and, for the spirit of truth. And Yes. <laughs> and, but clearly the, the, the conversation is the point, right? This is not, it, though this conversation had the character at many moments of a debate, I don't think either of us view it as a debate in, in the, the, the trivial sense. It's not about point scoring, it's about making sense in a way that's consequential because we're talking about issues of great consequence and you, you obviously care about these things and uh, it matters whether we converge on the most important questions in human life. And as you know, I'm worried that religion doesn't give us the tools we need to converge. What, what does give us the tools is a truly open-ended conversation and what, that then you simply have to look honestly at the obstacles toward any conversation being open-ended. And religion presents those first and, and most readily. It's, it is a, the idea that certain things have been decided for all time and there's no future evidence or argument that is admissible on those points. Now that is clearly bad everywhere in science. It's bad everywhere in, in how we renegotiate our proximity to one another in society. It, new laws and new ideas are born all the time about how to structure institutions and social relationships because new things happen. I mean, we didn't have an internet and then we did. So our old laws and our old expectations of human communication simply don't work I in the presence of this new thing, right? So we have to figure out, we, again, it's a navigation problem. And what I'm perpetually in contest with, uh, even in conversations like this, is the sense that the rules need to change just a little bit for this class of books. That, I mean, they, literally, this side of the bookstore, right? There's like any other part of the bookstore, well, then there's no barrier to honest conversation. But you move over here, you've got this shelf of books, there you, you, you have to hold your tongue. Right there, we can't pick and choose. We can't say that, while we can say that Shakespeare wrote some fantastic plays, the best plays ever written, and some are actually not that good, right? We can't say that about God, right? We have to find some tortured way to make the most of his diabolical utterances, right? That's the thing we have to outgrow. And so what I'm continually in tension with you is the degree to which uh, your style of talking about religion and narr the power of narrative and, and the meaning derived from it elides that point and seems to let people off the hook on that very point. And that's, the, that's where we need to hold the line, in my view. We need to... We need to sure. <clears throat> that, that... 
it has to be clear to us at this moment in history that no one has the right to their religious sectarianism, really. I mean, it, 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 up to the point, clearly, that there's a, there's a soccer, there's a World Cup version of it that is benign. But once it gets taken past that point, we, we have to figure out how to pull the brakes. And that becomes a real problem if you are, if you are going to dignify the foundational claims of these faiths, claims like revelation and paradise and blasphemy and apostasy. I mean, these are the things that you, you come up against. And uh, I think conversa conversations like this are incredibly important because we, we need to convince the better part of humanity that it's possible to live the best life possible without recourse to divisive nonsense. And where we draw the line between divisive nonsense and reasoned and necessary discourse is what we're, we're dickering over. And I think, I think it's important that we, we continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in closing, let me say, first of all, I'm tremendously honored that you asked me to moderate these debates. Uh, yeah, we, was, fantastic, thank you. Uh, it was, um, it was a, a truly remarkable experience. As for what was accomplished, I think it was a tremendous amount. I saw both of you move. I saw both of you exhibit tremendous generosity of spirit towards the other, and I think um, this has exceeded my expectations of what might have been possible in these discussions by quite a bit. Um, and that also, I will say, um, has a lot to do with the fact that for reasons I think none of us can explain, a huge amount of people, a huge population seems to care about these issues because they matter a great deal. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think yeah. this has been a very successful exercise and I think you can both justly be quite proud of what you've done. Yeah. All right, Thank let's you. give a huge round of applause for our speakers tonight. Pleasure, uh, you continue. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.